of doctoral consortium sessions on architecture and philosophy. Um, I'm delighted to have Patrick Schumacher with us today. Um, Patrick is particularly notable in the sense that he is trained both as an, an architect and as a philosopher. Um, and he's also a practicing architect. So he's somebody who can really demonstrate how the ideas of uh, philosophy can find their way into actual practice. Um, today we're looking at Nicholas Lerman, somebody that I don't have much of a background in, so I'm not going to say anything by way of introduction. But what I do want to do is to make a, a brief, before we get going, a brief, um, offer a brief manifesto about uh, what the series itself um, is about, architecture and philosophy, um, uh, as a kind of retroactive manifesto for the entire series. So I will, that will be my offering today. Um, but just to say briefly, this is now um, the, we've, the seventh of the series, and we've got two more to go. We're back to our usual schedule, which we will keep until the rest of the, um, the end of the session. Um, next week, we have Judith Butler with Helen Runting from, um, from Stockholm and Amelia Jones, the art theorist from USC. And then the final session on, on Gilbert Simondon. I'm looking forward to that. That, that the, Again, I know very little about Simondon. Andre Radman and Stavros from uh, UTU Delft. And Marissa Bell Marat uh, from Georgia Tech, who is a, a, a PhD student herself, and Victoria Luisa Barbo will be uh, joining us for that. Um, all of these sessions are um, uploaded to our Digital Futures YouTube channel um, for the future as a repository. And this is part of the purpose of what we're doing. That is to say, to, to make available uh, recordings which bring together some of the experts in the world as a resource for, for students and, and architects throughout the world for the future um, as a permanent resource um, where that can be accessed. And some of the sessions so far, I think, have been extraordinary. Um, uh, uh, the Jacques Derrida, Helen Sixu one, especially with Peter Eisman, Bernard Shumi, and Doina Petrescu. Uh, and they've been very popular as well in terms of the number of views they received on YouTube. So hopefully we're doing the right thing. I'm also delighted to hear that there are some students from um, literally all over the world. Uh, I heard from a, a student in Kenya this week that she's been watching these and encouraging her colleagues to watch them. It's great to make that, to, to see the impact it's having. I'd like to thank Philip Yuan, who has been, um, uh, who, who, is, uh, who, who helped, to, helped to launch this whole doctoral uh, consortium project in the summer. We held, held a series of, um, uh, of sessions over the summer, um, which are, are recorded and uh, uh, uploaded onto our library, um, including Slavoj Žižek and some other um, very significant figures. The second part of this series is, is thinking about these key, key uh, thinkers and discussing what architects have to learn from philosophy and indeed whether these thinkers are still relevant today. Um, so um, let me then quickly then play for you this uh, brief um, retroactive manifesto. Manifesto. It's a very personal take on these things, um, but this is trying to, to outline why I think it's so important for architects to engage with philosophy. Um, so let me just uh, play that briefly. Retroactive manifesto. What is the relationship between architecture and philosophy? Is there one? After all, architecture is a discourse of form, of building forms, of potential building forms. Meanwhile, philosophy is a discourse of ideas, of concepts, of arguments. They are quite distinct disciplines. They're quite different. So what is the connection between architecture and philosophy? Here I want to lay out two areas where the relationship is somewhat problematic. I want to look at how philosophers have engaged with architecture and then how architects have engaged with philosophy. Then finally, I want to explain where I think philosophy can have the greatest impact on architecture. Let us turn first then to the way in which philosophers have engaged with architecture. And there are several incidents where key thinkers have 
address buildings and architecture. But the problem is that philosophers tend to look at buildings and architecture in a different way to how architects look at them. For example, Michel Foucault looks at the panopticon, the design for a prison with a central tower and the cells arranged, arranged irradially around them. He looks at this, but he doesn't look at this in terms of the architecture. He looks at the panopticon in terms of a diagram of how society operates. He sees it as illustration, an illustration of how society operates. Now, we architects are used to diagrams of buildings. We are not used to buildings becoming diagrams of how society operates. Freddie Jameson does something very similar with the Bonaventure Hotel in Los Angeles. He uses this hotel to illustrate the homogenizing placelessness of late capitalist society. The fact that everybody gets lost in the atrium of the hotel, it become, becomes in some way a, a way of illustrating the lack of cognitive mapping, the lack of bearings that people have in the logic within the logic of late capitalism. But he's not talking about the architecture itself. Likewise, Deleuze and Guattari refer to the Gothic and the Romanesque in their discourse about the war machine. But they're not referring to the Gothic and the Romanesque as styles of architecture. They're referring to the Gothic and the Romanesque as ways of thinking, as logics of thinking. The Romanesque being based on a template, a visual template, according to fixed laws of proportions, and the Gothic being an exploration, an experimental exploration of how one might construct form in a very bottom-up way. Equally, we have someone like Jacques Derrida referring to deconstruction. What he means by deconstruction is not anything to do with architecture as such. He's, used, he's deploying an architectural metaphor. Derrida's argument is that we should deconstruct not the forms of architecture, but our constructed ways of approaching architecture, our constructed ways of looking at the world itself. We therefore have to operate like an architect. We have to dismantle all those preconceptions, all the privileged hierarchies, all the distorted ways of looking at the world in order to dig down to a solid foundation from which we can then build an argument. Simmel, too, refers to architectural elements. He writes about the bridge and the door. But he's not writing, writing about the bridge and the door as architectural elements. He's using them to articulate the two different modes of thinking, connecting and separating categories. The bridge is that, is that which connects two things that are separated, and the door is that which divides what is continuous. The bridge and the door, therefore, serve to as illustrations of articulations of two different ways of thinking. But perhaps it's the bridge that offers us some indication of how we can engage with the world of philosophy. For Zimmel, what cannot connect something unless it is first separated, and what cannot separate something unless it is originally connected. Can we therefore connect, build a link, build an interaction between architecture and philosophy? Architects too often look at philosophy. They are inspired by philosophy. They borrow from, from philosophy. They use philosophy. But architects often misunderstand philosophy. Architects tend to architecturalize everything they see or hear. They turn it into architectural form. But sometimes the concepts used by philosophers are not referring to architectural form at all. When Deleuze writes about the fold, he's not referring to folded form. He's not referring
referring to pleated matter. He's actually referring to subjectivities, both human and non-human. He's referring to ways of thinking. And yet architects automatically somehow interpret the notion, the concept of a fold, as though it is some kind of architectural form. So do Derrida. When he uses the term deconstruction, he's not talking about architecture. He's using an architectural metaphor, perhaps, but he's not talking about architecture itself. He's talking about the constructed way by which we look at the world. There is a danger, then, that architects misunderstand philosophy. They misunderstand philosophy and take concepts from philosophy and translate them into architectural forms. There's also a danger that architects will use philosophy as a way of adding a certain intellectual veneer to their project. It adds a certain depth, it adds a certain meaning, it adds a certain philosophical dimension. But philosophy is not a fashion accessory. Philosophy should not be used in this way. There is a danger then that architects misuse, misunderstand and abuse philosophy. There is no such thing as a philosophy of architecture or indeed an architecture of philosophy. Architecture is not built philosophy. What then is the relationship between architecture and philosophy? What is the role of philosophy, perhaps, in terms of the discourse of architecture? You must recognize there is no such thing as an architecture of philosophy, or indeed a philosophy of architecture, but there is a relationship, a potential relationship between architecture and philosophy. To my mind, we must recognize that architecture is itself a discourse, a discourse about buildings. And as such, theory plays an important role in that discourse. And it is theory, theory itself, that can be interrogated through philosophy. And that, to my mind, is where the potential of philosophy lies. Philosophy, as Gilles Deleuze has said, is exactly like a box of tools. Theory is like a box of tools. You can use those tools and deploy them. You can use them to challenge things, to open up, to prize open questions, to challenge the cosy hegemony of architectural thinking, to call it into question, not in order to destroy it, but rather to expose the weakness in the argument. When Frederick Jameson criticizes Kenneth Frampton and his use of critical regionalism, exposing the problems in the term, the complicity of the term within late capitalism itself. He's not doing this in order to destroy Frampton. He's doing this to point out the weakness in the argument, in order perhaps for Frampton to improve that argument, to make it to make it make sense. Likewise, when Theodore Adorno criticizes Adolf Loos for the way in which he addresses the question of function in architecture, He's not doing that to destroy Adolfus. Rather, he's trying, to, he's trying to expose the undialectical way with which he's approaching the question of functionalism. He's exposing a problem, a problem that can be addressed in some way. And that, to my mind, is the role of philosophy. Philosophy provides architectural theory with a set of tools, a set of useful tools to question, to criticize, to problematize. And that's what the role of theory itself is. Theory should not be there to legitimize an architectural position. Theory is about questioning, challenging, trying to, to, to call into question received views in order to improve them. And that, to my mind, is the role of philosophy and the relationship between philosophy and architecture. As Derrida puts it, to go after it, to go after architecture, not in order to attack, destroy, or deroute it, to criticize or disqualify it, rather in order to think it, in fact, to detach itself sufficiently to apprehend it in a thought, 
which goes beyond the theorem and becomes a work in its turn. That perhaps is the role of philosophy. Philosophy and architecture, architecture and philosophy. We can bring ideas from philosophy, concepts from philosophy, add them to architecture, add them to architecture, philosophy and architecture, architecture and philosophy, in order to improve architecture, in order to make architectural theory itself more rigorous. That, to my mind, is the role of philosophy. Okay. Um, as I say, that was a very personal view on uh, the logic behind this, and maybe a controversial one in some way, but I thought it'd be good to, just, to put it out there. Um, so Nicholas Lerman, I'm just going to say just a few, few words about him, um, just to give you some kind of context. Patrick, of course, is the architectural expert on, on Nicholas Lerman. Um, but Nicholas Lerman is, was a German sociologist, a philosopher, of social science and was particularly famous for his work on systems theory. He is uh, also interested in the theme of uh, autopoiesis, which of course has become uh, part of Patrick's own discourse. And he's, uh, I've not come across it before in my own particular work, but I've come across those whom he, um, who he, who, whom he influenced. Um, uh, uh, in particular, um, Jürgen Habermas, um, who is, uh, who belonged to the kind of the second stage of the Frankfurt School of, of Critical Theory after Adorno, Horkheimer, and others in the beginning, um, but they but locates him very firmly within the world of, of social research. Um, so let me pass over to Patrick um, and um, welcome, Patrick. It's great to have you here. You are, uh, as a philosopher and an architect, you are the person who can talk to us about these questions. Let me unshare my screen. Um, and uh, yes. Yeah, hi, hi guys, hi everybody. Thanks for having me on this Luminous. I invested a lot of time in Luminous, it was a great inspiration and I've developed my theory of architecture in a way that it is embedded in Luhmann's social systems theory, in particular in Luhmann's theory of modern society, because I believe that that's the grounding a comprehensive theory of architecture requires, it needs to embed itself in an overarching uh, theory of society to know its place and contribution uh, within society and societal processes. And also uh, to, to know itself as part of society in a very kind of, let's say, sophisticated, but also updated way. And I think uh, that's uh, what um, where I've been looking for that kind of grounding. And initially I was looking uh, at Marxism and then I discovered Habermas, as was my next, uh, uh, you know, uh, attempt. And then I found in Luhmann things fell into place and really uh, very strongly and beautifully because there was a lot of coincidence of, of interest with what at the time architecture has also had it picked up. The kind of integration with complexity theory in particular, I would, I would argue, has been, and been very fruitful. And uh, this Luhmann has a very, very general abstract theory of society, which is not just, for instance, a theory of capitalism uh, or a theory of um, you know, democracy or, or welfare state or things like that. It is trying to be encompassing and encompass all these aspects and including uh, writings on the art system, on the sciences, on the economy, et cetera, but also, um, um, yeah, universal and, co and comprehensive, so that architecture is also in, not specifically addressed, but can find its place within that uh, panoramic view of society. And that's what I've done. I got a lot of inspiration from his work. So today I will not talk about uh, my um, architectural expansion and extension of the work of Luhmann. I will do that in another series of lectures I'm giving in Tongji very soon, uh, for, uh, later this year and early next year. But I will uh, set the scene for that with describing Luhmann first as a philosopher and then as a theory of all things social, and then in particular as a, th a theory theorist of uh, modern society, which has a lot of important and puzzling features. Uh, and as there's always this kind of delay in <laughs> philosophy and theory with respect to picking up latest development, I think there is a, some radical innovations which he offers 
I think are very pertinent. And a lot of our social theorizing and categories are still kind of um, vested and maybe be, don't belong really to our time, belong to an older era. That's anyway has been Luhmann's argument. So um, let me share my screen at this point. And let me get right in. So thanks, uh, uh, <coughs> Neil, also for your introductions, very interesting. I do believe that there could be and should be a philosophy of architecture. It's basically at the general abstract and profoundly questioning end of architectural theory that we can find moments. Uh, like there is a, you know, there is a, a philosophy of law, a philosophy of um, other domains, uh, 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 like there's political philosophy, etc. Why couldn't there be a philosophy of architecture, like there's also a philosophy of science, philosophy of even particular science, like biology, etc. And I think there are, and in my works, you can find fragments <laughs> towards the philosophy of architecture. And in any way, philosophy is not necessarily a systematic condition. I find certainly in figures like Kipnis contributions to what could become a philosophy of architecture. So anyway, that's something I thank you for that for that kind of challenge. Uh, that, that's something which isn't currently existing as something an established discourse, surely not. Uh, but there is something which eventually can can develop and maybe somebody get inspired and to write a philosophy of architecture. So Nicholas Luhmann as philosopher, he is in fact also a uh, basically a sociologist, but he started off, uh, he's deeply studying philosophy in fact, uh, as well as uh, law. Later on, it shows his, his influence back in in the world of um, all sorts of discourses is is not only in, in in sociology, but he has a big influence, actually, in particular on uh, jurisprudence, legal theory, and the philosophy of law. So, uh, but I want to first also talk about what philosophy is. It's not a profession that directly contributes to to any everyday societal problem or task. Uh, it rather offers speculative intellectual resources to the various specialized theoretical literatures that steer the function systems and function systems and professions, and I will talk about function systems later, uh, of modern society. Sciences, economy, law, politics, education, media, and design, architecture and the design disciplines is for me one of the function systems uh, which uh, would, in, the, in their kind of, uh, let's say, the more general, comprehensive, um, they think their own problematic and their means of addressing us and the societal environment in which they operate, they will also uh, hit at questions which have a philosophical feel to it and they will kind of penetrate into philosophy. So what I believe philosophy is basically constituted on the one hand on professional philosophers, it's a contemporary philosophy I'm talking about, of course, and on the other hand, a lot of um, the deep thinkers and great innovators in the very specialized domains, they in the sense contribute into philosophy because they are hitting, they get inspired by philosophers, but they, they, they inject back into philosophy clearly. Uh, you have something like, something like Norman Chomsky out of linguistics where you have <clears throat> um, uh, people like Maturana Varela out of, out, out of biology into, into philosophy, et cetera. You have, you have that two-way um, interfacing and it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't become a profession uh, like uh, many others. So I just wanted to also uh, then say, okay, um, the functions of philosophy, they're multiple in the 20s and 21st century, uh, latent and manifest. So on the one hand you have, and there are different types of philosophy because it isn't a kind of coherent profession. It is this kind of brainstorming chamber, that, that deep questioning arena where you have uh, all the dif different disciplines flow into uh, and out of. So you have intellectual iconoclasm, uh, the radical reframing of conceptions, and you have figures like Wittgenstein, Heidegger, Bataille, Derrida, Adorno, and Luhmann, I would agree. This is also the purpose where, where Luhmann fits into many of these. Then there's inspirational conceptual creativity, abstract algebra of terms. So that's Deleuze and Guattari have actually defined philosophy as the creation of concepts. Baudrillard is in there, and, and Triple O, I think, as well. Bartley, uh, Radnitsky are figures you might not know. I'm particularly interested. Uh, <clears throat> but Luhmann actually could also be mentioned here. He's been quite creative in terms of generating fresh conceptions 
which can also then migrate out of sociology or into various subdomains. It's an exchange hub for new concepts and modes of theorizing. That's why I think where the versus when complexity theory feeds into this or new, uh, the latest versions of Marxism and theorizing the revolution flow into uh, philosophy where, where the, you know, yes, recent sciences flow in, etc. So you have uh, this exchange hub, and Deleuze Gattori are fantastic in this. Particular Thousand Plateau is this, where they, where they, this big sponge which absorbs any new forms of theorizing, turns of argument, some conceptions, which come from the various, you know, domains outside philosophy, let's say, and bring them and and then and, and re-abstracting them off and then sending them out again to everybody. That's the exchange hub idea. Beth and Lanfi with the, with the general system theory is one of those from Förster, uh, uh, somebody like Manuel de Landa as well. They're not necessarily, uh, you know, coming out of the professional, rigorous, uh, philosophical academia, uh, but I think there's an essential um, uh, function of philosophy is that existential. Uh, it's sometimes a speculative proto-science, the frontier of function systems. Dawkins, Dennett, Clark, David Friedman for the, for the legal system, for instance, Maturala, Varela as well. Uh, so let's say those scientists who are um, thinking ahead, they're not doing empirical projects, you know, high, you know, clearly delimited with, with, with budgets and, and, and uh, you know, a, a strict research program focused on results, but they're projecting ahead. Uh, and so, um, the rational reconstruction of science and other function systems. So it's this kind of clarification and an attempt to be uh, some kind of super ego overlooking and critically accompanying uh, the systematic working through of the sciences. But it's also this idea of scientific unification. And that's very important. It's in each broad science. Now you have to have the unifiers, those who are generating, uh, you know, because there's this general drift of specialization of fragmentation into disciplines, subdisciplines and specialisms. And, and, and it, they, they all develop their own terminology. There's some kind of scanning of that and reforging that, you know, science by science, but then also across sciences it is very important project. And there you have people like Carnap, Sellers, Bashka, Churchman, Dennett again, Habermas and Luhmann also with respect <clears throat> to let's say a subdomain, all the social and political phenomena in science. Uh, then there's of course the radical critique, more those kind of act, philosophy become activism, uh, radical critique and frontier of social, economic and political progress, Hayek, Rothbard, Latour, Foucault, Habermas and Luhmann again on that. And then this final, uh, let's say agenda, which is the old kind of story that with maybe Hegel started, the intellectual unification of all aspects of the human project. And that's I was always fascinated by this, and they seem to be only Germans who are who are um, coping with that. And that's Marx is the great, the greatest figure after Hegel who's actually done that. Habermas is one of those, and Luhmann is also one of those. So, so Habermas and Luhmann, I was attracted to them because these are the only figures in philosophy, and also then realizing it has it can't be <clears throat> just abstract conceptual understanding. It needs to be the grasping of society, it's contemporary conditions, it's, it's dynamics. It has to be, you know, political philosophy as well as political economy, as well as uh, a new innovative legal conception. So, so these two are the ones who could, I, I would kind of say, if Marxism is, has run its course and is, is, is kind of painting itself into an ideological corner, where can I go with having that kind of taking the, let's say, taking the whole weight of humanities project onto its shoulders, it's Habermas and it's Luhmann. So, and I moved from Marx to Habermas to Luhmann. So, um, <clears throat> and so this talk, I mean, I was planning to speak now, it might, I already realized it might take a little longer. Uh, please bear with me, but I've kind of, as I said, I've cut out this last part, the theory of architectural interfaces number five, I will not talk about, but I have these four chapters. So first of all, I'll briefly talk intellectual sources and resources of Luhmann's work. Then his social systems theory, which is a general sociology of everything social. Then because we're talking about philosophy, his constructivist epistemology. And then finally, uh, fourth, the theory of modern society 
which I think is, is the bulk of his later work in particular. And that's where my uh, theory of architecture is embedded. It would then come on after, but I will not be able to get to this uh, today. So we're starting with intellectual sources and resources, and there are many. And so interestingly, Luhmann started off in organization theory uh, because he was working as a lawyer in um, government administration. And uh, he was, and I was actually discovering also through that because I was, as you, you might, some of you might know, interested in corporate organization, business organization and the theory of that for many, many years because coming out of Marxism and being interested in political economy and realizing that there is a radical transformation of the contemporary economy and that business organization are radically transformed in highly progressive ways in through you know concepts of flattening of hierarchies of self-directedness of work of self-organization of a very complex sophisticated uh, you know double encoding of, of domains and com of competency intersecting I saw a lot of coincidence which what which which what was emerging with folding and later on parametrism so I was very much into it and, and Luhmann started off there. His sociology is organizational sociology. You know, something like Herbert Simon, who later on became a major figure in uh, artificial intelligence research and related in cognitive science, exactly started there as well. And uh, Herbert Simon is a, is, a, is, a, is a key reference for Luhmann's uh, work. Then Luhmann uh, went to, uh, actually went to Harvard to learn with Carl Todd Parsons. He was already, Luhmann was already in his 30s. Uh, uh, and it was shifted out of, uh, shifted into a, an academic career at that time. So, so he went to Harvard and taught, uh, it was learning with Parsons and sitting in seminars and Falco Parsons is a major, was the totally towering figure of uh, world sociology. There is no such figure anymore. In the 19, late 1930s, 40s, 50s, uh, 60s. And then of course, Habermas was a great influence on, on, on uh, Luhmann. Now, Luhmann was also uh, very well versed in the philosophy, in particular German idealism, Kant, Fichte, Schelling, Hegel, and in particular, very deeply uh, uh, studied Edmund Husserl. Um, and uh, what we're seeing here is basically this idea of this philosophy of consciousness, the philosophy of self reflectiveness, of complex uh, self reference you find in these philosophies and it transferred that, uh, you know, this basically the philosophy of self-consciousness and self-reflectiveness into the social domain, where the subject, the self-reflective, self-referential subject becomes the social system. Very important influences here from, from uh, the, that strand of German philosophy. And then he went into, you know, Actually, Talco Parsons was also somebody who was early on connecting up the, the social theory. I mean, they said that in the 50s uh, with uh, Norbert Wiener, with cybernetics, uh, with, with systems theory, and many other figures. He was part of the Macy's conferences. And Harvard's also picked up. He saw the potential that systems theory could be, could be influencing um, sociology. And then he, he, he found Figures like Gotthard Günther, George Spencer Brown, and in fact, also you can see systems theory complexity, the second order cybernetic, Hans von Förster, where, 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 and out Maturana Rafareda, that whole world, he brought it into the social sciences in a very, very original way. And you can find, so I will talk a little bit later uh, more uh, in, in detail. And then, of course, evolutionary theory, uh, where he was uh, interested in, in new, in the evolution of evolution, in the evolution of evolutionary mechanisms. and I mean, that's a, it's a big um, um, influence as well. So this is a lot. So I don't wanna to go too much detail in this slide. I mean, he was born in, in, in 1927, uh, died in 98, uh, relatively early. He was uh, only 71 years old. So he just says, you know, he was at Harvard with T Parsons. What is interesting, he then went uh, uh, work with, uh, he was invited by Helmut Schelsky, a major, uh, German sociologist to take up a, 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 a chair in Biele Fund, but in the in-between he, he actually took over Adorno's chair at Frankfurt as in a temporary position while Habermas was already there since 64 and they actually the, uh, written a 
and a very interesting, co-authored an interesting debate with each other. Um, and um, so, but then he finally settled in, in 68, 69, so, so in 69, and stayed uh, for uh, the, about the 30 years in one place, just systematically working through a system of the social sciences and of modern society, which he already mapped out and um, just kind of head down working through. So again, I just mentioned already Parsons and Habermas as major, major influences. Uh, and then um, Heinzel first, it's very interesting, he, he established the Biological Computer Laboratory in 58, and there's all these figures like Ashby, Wiener, von Neumann, um, speaking Gotthard Günther, Humberto Maturana, Francesca Varela, Ernst von Glaserfeld. So that's also the world which, which, which Luhmann became very familiar with, and he had dialogues with Heinz von Förster, citing Heinz von Förster. Uh, and this idea of second-order cybernetics, where, where, where a, a cybernetics becomes kind of self-reflective, also influenced through somebody like Gotthard Günther, who was actually a Hegel specialist, brought into that context was very interesting. And that's where some of the combustive, let's say, um, uh, chemistry <laughs> emerged between German idealism theory, uh, you know, the, the highly uh, sophisticated uh, theory of self-reflective consciousness, and then uh, feedback mechanism and, and cybernetics, and that all of that fusing into, into social science. It was, that's the origin uh, of, um, Luhmann's oeuvre, Luhmann's system, but of course, in the end, you, these origins, you, you leave them behind and you, 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 you work something out which, which is self-sustaining. So these are some of the figures coming out of that uh, realm. Particularly interesting also, uh, George Spencer Brown, the, the English mathematician. I will come to that further. You'll see some of those resonances in uh, what, we, what we're looking at in more detail when it comes to the um, logic and epistemology of of Luhmann. So, so Luhmann's oeuvre is interestingly um, dissected, it's a little bit like Wittgenstein nearly, you know, early, early work and la late work. Um, and so 64 to 1980, a very, very prolific, hundreds of articles and, and many books. And then there's this kind of, and he was already a systems theorists, I mean, through Parsons and so system theories all the way through, but the discovery of autopoiesis of probably reading uh, the, you know, Maturana uh, and Varela's autopoiesis and cognition was published in 1980, he, 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 he saw the, some chance and some inspiration to recalibrate and re-ground all his, all his thinking and build up a kind of, his rebuild the system anew. And that started in 1984 till the end of his life. So, so this is the what he is mostly known for. So he started off with a with a that book, Social Systems, coming out in 84. It's the theory of everything social, extremely abstract, and it's therefore incredibly general, but also very very stimulating. And then he has gone through. Um, a series of monographs um, of societal subsystems, autopoetic subsystem of society. And he's gone, you know, he's, and each of them is a full book length monograph, uh, you know, on the economy, on, on the system of sciences, on law. So he always calls it the economy of society, the science of society, the law of society, the political system of society. You're also on art, the art of society, the religion of society, the education of society, the reality of the mass media. Um, and in the end, he has packaged it all up. And then he had a kind of final keystone work called the Society of the Society, where he kind of, that's the, in two volumes, a major work representing the theory of modern society, integrating and building on top of, and finally you know, sort of synthesizing all these monographic works and also tying back with his initial kind of, there's a the beginning shot, then the big sequence, and then the final conclusion. It's, it's a fantastic, let's say, uh, coherent system, edifice, theoretical, a very impressive theoretical edifice. And then in parallel, he's run um, four volumes of social structure and semantics, which is 
reflecting on the linguistic resources and which which are available at, at any time and how they uh, because systems of communication, social system or systems of communication, they rely on language, they rely on distinction on conceptual resources, and they are really because you can't create them ex na hilo. So that's you have to kind of actually um, see them evolve and see how and work with them and trying to notch them and push them further and redissect them. Uh, but but that's very important. The kind of history of of of, of con it's a conceptual development uh, in, in uh, running in parallel. So very very interesting and and, and and powerful. So I start now going to the social system theory as the uh, let's say the beginning shot, the foundation let's say of the overall system of uh, which includes later on the the, the uh, theory of modern society. That's obviously the target. The target is to understand the contemporary condition. Um, with its opportunities and limitations, etc. So Lumen's social system theory is a comprehensive, and that's very important, general sociology that claims to encompass and count for everything social, all social phenomena, from the fleeting interactions you know you might have in a, in a cafe to states to world society. And that's important to him. So he's criticizing it like yes, there is kind of organizational sociology and the sociology of the, the political system, and maybe there's, you know, um, uh, theory of capitalism, etc. No, there needs to be what ties it all together. Is there something a really general um, uh, uh, sociological system? I mean, somebody like Max Weber maybe um, was was kind of edging towards that, and, and and to some extent Parsons was is the other model for that. But it's very rare that this is attempted, and he's kind of radicalizing Parsons in terms of comprehensive scope. So it also accounts for institutions like the sciences. This implies, and that's important here, the theory also includes itself in its object domain because it is itself, you know, sociology as a science and it, it, it is a scientific, a social scientific account of all everything social. So it must include itself. And this means that Luhmann's social system theory is, or rather theory as itself, and it is his phrase, a super theory, uh, and I come to that com concept even further. So that's important, uh, and you can, can imagine that uh, that these kind of challenges, total comprehensiveness, uh, including uh, you know, coherently theorizing itself with the same conceptual resources through which everything else is uh, um, uh, uh, theorized, and every generalization you make is also tested whether it holds true about your own processes. And I think, uh, so, so these are, you know, let's say um, ambitions on steroids and that what attracted me to this. Um, so the super theory is an ontological theory, a theory that includes itself and locates and explains its own possibility of existence, its role within a, a society with the same conceptual system uh, that explains everything else in society. So, so they are, Luhmann isn't the only one. I mean, he's the only one, he's the first one who has made that a headline or made it very explicit. Uh, and you can find that uh, actually towards the end of his work. <laughs> it's not something he, you know, you know he, he's formulated at the beginning uh, in, he's, you'll find it in the, in, in the, theory of the Society of Society. So the examples, I mean, Hegel's theory of the historical unfolding of self-consciousness and freedom includes itself as a culmination of its own narrative. So Hegel is the big, the big figure um, in terms of super theory. And then Marxism theorizes its theoretical adversaries in that uh, uh, as, as material interests included, induced, uh, sorry, uh, uh, partial and necessary false consciousness and ideology. So he, Marx is, uh, theorizing himself as well, his own theoretical endeavors, but also all the counter ideologies. So its own stance is deemed impartial and truly scientific as, a, as it represents the perspective of the universal class who struggles for emancipation, guided by Marxism is bound to drive towards a classless society, not divided by the divergent interest and perspective. So Marxism, uh, you know, operates with the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the concept of ideology and that all thinking is tied to partiality, to par partial 
conditions we love understand, but how does it escape from this by saying, well, because yes, we are tied to one partial group, the working class, but they're the universal class. They're the class which will era e erase all classes. Anyway, so it's a, it's a, it's a clearly, clearly autological, you know, it's the theory which explains itself and has its theory on its own trajectory and purposes inbuilt into the theory. And, and that's why it's autological. So I see these examples and I don't, I, and Habermas, I will not explain to you how, but Habermas as well. So the three big figures, Marx, Habermas, Luhmann, uh, based on Hegel, they are the ones who del 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 delivered uh, super theory. So Luhmann, social systems theory and theory of modern functionally differentiated society locates itself within sociology, within the function system of the sciences, ascribes to itself the function of steering, reflection and the self-description of society which is also in Luhmann's terms a necessity, uh, it becomes a kind of one of the exigencies of, 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 of society to have that. Anyway, so, so super theory and um, also kind of embedding the society in a larger, let's say ontology in the world of commerce. Um, ontology is we are careful with that phrase, but we can maybe say that in a, let's say the larger philosophical framing of his work. So that's basically um, self-referential autopoetic systems, uh, living systems. That's why it comes from the idea of Maturana Varela, cells, brains, organisms. These are self-referentially closed systems. Um, <clears throat> psychic system and social systems are all self-referential autopoetic systems. So they, they, they say, this theory of social systems is kind of embedded into a in a larger uh, research, well, he's not researching these, but he, he is kind of mapping out the location of social systems in the, in the larger, in the larger sciences, let's say, of the theory and science of self-referential autopoetic systems. And what is interesting is that um, both psychic systems and social systems are using uh, meaning using systems, or they're operating in the medium of sense. Uh, here via consciousness and here via social systems via communications. And here it's, uh, these are metabolic processes. But it's very interesting, the, the idea that the concept of cognition can also be applied to uh, metabolic processes in terms of differences that make a difference, uh, you know, uh, stimulus response, uh, triggers, feedback systems, etc. So the other thing which is important to realize that um, Luhmann decides, I mean, to re kind of conceptualize and reground sociology, it used to be an action, you know, through Parsons and others, uh, was, was framed as action theory. So he moved on to sociology, sociology as communication theory. So Parsons had systematized sociological classics under the heading of a sociology as action theory in Luhmann's system. Communication replaces action as a basic element of social processes. So the, the explanation is here. And so one must begin. I mean, basically, so cut the shot. I mean, communication is always involving um, several individuals. Where action could sometimes be also be kind of a, a solitary act. So that's why I think communication is is more appropriate. And also, what is already in action theory, in communication, is more explicit. In fact, I add to this that there is these. The, the meaning element. So, so human action in sociology was always an action of, you know, uh, under the kind of means end relationship, but it, it always had an interpretive, a meaning element. You mean to do that, it has an intention, it has a conceptual element. It's actually linguistically mediated all the way through, or at least in the, uh, um, uh, expressible in the meaning. So, so that comes clearer in communication. So communication is a, is, is, is a stronger, um, uh, grounding, it's also the phrase, the term is more explicit in that it's always interaction, it's always meaning, and, and, but in the substance of it, it's not so hugely different. You can, he, Luhmann started to write his early works uh, using, using the word action and later substituted with the word the communication. Um, okay. So here's a, a very strong theoretical decision at the very beginning, which is quite radical and I think quite productive. 
And he's basically saying uh, society is made up not out of people, but it consists of nothing but communication or the continuous process of communications, hooking onto uh, communications, so recursive communications. And that's kind of Luhmann's words of, the, let's say, the death of the author, where you have intertextuality, where, where, where some, sometimes in post structuralist literary criticism, et cetera, you're looking at the text and texts, influencing texts, and you kind of, you're not interested in the, in the personality of the author and, and his life and history is irrelevant. And that's the, the attitude Luhmann brings to sociology. It's, you know, you could call it an anti-humanism, if you like. Um, and basically what he's saying here, and maybe it's not time to read that all out, but he's saying that, you know, sociology and has separated from psychology over hundred years. These, these, these disciplines have developed they deepen intricately with very different kind of agendas and, and, and conceptualizations. So, so, so to, to, to think of uh, sociology consisting out of human beings and persons, that's just an abstract shift anyway. And it's psychology is going to deeper into understanding that complex entity. And in sociology, we should kind of abstract from that. And it just becomes a point of reference in the communication process. And it's actually the person which communicates and is recognized in systems of in social systems actually construct of the communication process itself. And uh, the, the, these organisms, these human beings, these psychic systems, um, they, they, kind of, they, they exist in, in the environment of the um, social system. So, so all communications are operations within systems of communication. That's why it's important, they're not standalone, they're never isolated. And uh, within these system, communications are attributed to either persons or organizations. That's also, I mean, a lot of times now we have, uh, we have organizations communication, communicating rather than persons, and these are legal persons, and who is actually an implementing and, and, and sending an email on behalf of is, 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 is effectively irrelevant. Uh, so persons are constructed, individually distinguished within and by systems of communication. Um, I think that's quite a radical step, and I think it's very healthy because you you can it's it's distilling out the particular let's say research agenda of psych sociology and separating it off from from psychology. It doesn't mean that later on there can't be overlap. There isn't some. There could still be something like social psychology. So. Um, Luhmann's relational ontology. And relationism, I want to emphasize this, is very, very big. Here, everything is always related to everything else. Nothing is freestanding. And you can build up from, you know, basic elements and, and aggregate of this. And that stands to get, you know, that's important to defend. So the social world consists of communication. Ephemeral events or operations as basic elements. This includes verbal, written, and all nonverbal communication, like, you know, gestures and, and screams and, uh, blowing kisses, whatever, um, including transfers of goods and money as well. So that's, he's expanding that um, uh, concept to all interactions, social interactions uh, uh, under, the, under that heading of communications. These communications connect up with each other. They form contaminations, episodes, and these contaminations, communication constitutes communication processes. So we have the operations, we, they form processes, and also important, the next point, they are all operating in the medium of sense or meaning. And, and that is important. So that means that it's, it's basically language, semiology, not only language, because there are other forms of meaning, of uh, meaning uh, um, uh, um, media, not only language. So including architecture. So, so that's why the, the, the semiological project uh, is, is pertinent because all social processes are uh, operating in the medium of meaning. And that includes when I set the premise for an event by constructing a particular space and ordering uh, relationships and iconography in a particular way. So, so but what's important that all communications are located in systems of communication, in specific systems of communication, and not just freestanding or just generic communication as such. They're always specifically located. Um, and 
there, of course, all, that's the definition of society. All communications form society together, but they're all always more specifically located within society as a system of all systems of communication. So they can't exist free floating. They can only occur defined, framed in social situations. Their existence in divergent identities as always already presupposes the system of systems of communication. So society is a system of systems. And when you when you act, you you, you have to self-locate. You have to kind of, you have to kind of tie in and understand these choices of situations of systems, and you're always operating in one or another of them. So examples of social systems, and that's also a very, very broad concept. Uh, so it's an ephemeral conversation which might happen, but it starts to form a, a system in the sense that you have already hit on a topic. Uh, there's already two, three people together. And so they're, they're not closing, they're self-referentially closing. And some, they can't just, somebody randomly from the outside throw something at them that wouldn't belong then to that little uh, conversation. And you need to form this concatenation, this little system to, 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 um, to reach more specific ends. So that's from all the way from there to a temporary travel group, an intimate couple is a social system, a circle of friends, a club, schools, firms, professions, and that comes more abstract, you know, the sciences, discourses, markets, states. But, uh, and anyway, there, there are three categories. There's interaction systems, then there's kind of organized groups, organizations where you, with members and certain rules. And, and then there is, let's say, it, let's call it um, societal uh, systems. I, a good phrase to use is discourses. Uh, um, these are the different types of systems in which we're always locating. So here at the moment, for instance, we are we are forming a, that um, um, the participants here form a particular uh, social systems around the seminar, and uh, but it's framed as as a certain type of system uh, within academia as part of the uh, the discipline of the sciences, and that regulates what's the protocols of interaction and what's what should and should be expected. It kind of makes it also easier to participate. You know, we know that nobody is kind of, we can, we can roughly understand what's coming, what's legitimate, what belongs here and what doesn't. And that allows you to, to, to join something. Like There's not some kind of bad surprises where you suddenly face a kind of horrible insult or something like this about your looks. Um, anyway, so, um, so these are also kind of nested uh, systems, always. Um, so the distinction between society and its non-societal environment is based on distinguishing within the process of, this communi uh, of communication, what is a communication and what is not. So the snowstorm building up from the east is not communica communication. It does not respond to any command or plea or way, or way to reroute. So, so we have, <clears throat> but also, you know, an organism uh, that, you know, is, 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 is shaking or there's some kind of emotions uh, and, or some, some displeasure or some kind of uh, psychic events, there aren't communication as such. Maybe they become expressed as communication. So we have basically the environment of social systems and society, what belongs to society is, is, is what's outside of society and maybe can refer to through communication, but isn't communication. That's basically nature, and this includes human nature, human organisms and psychic systems. <clears throat> so, and that's important. So another thing is uh, to realize that what we're talking about here is this kind of idea of self-referential closure of these systems of communication. So all communications are recursive. They, are, they always relate to others. They, they concatenate, they're tied in with each other, but they're also, um, in terms of what belongs and what doesn't belong to a particular conversation, to a particular discipline, to a particular discourse, um, there is this kind of boundary maintenance and boundary uh, policing nearly, and a boundary awareness, and this kind of self-referential closure. What connects here? There are certain conceptual preconditions, um, um, and, and that's what we're learning when we navigate these systems. We're learning. Uh, uh, to, to understand these various boundaries, which structure and order in a way the, the, the total communication process. And they are autopoetic 
systems because each of these, let's say, a particular science, a particular discipline, or a particular um, profession, they self-organize. I mean, they're not installed. There are social pr communication processes where where things one thing fits to another, and things which the, the distills gradually its particular, let's say, function, its professional code of conduct, its kind of membership um, acceptance rules, etc. They they they're organized. It's a form of because of past effect. It's an evolutionary process of self-organization, which is also then uh, leads to this kind of self-referential closure uh, of what, what's inside, what's outside. And also it's, it's, it's it, it, what belongs to this kind of system of categories, terms, concepts, uh, let's say axioms and truisms, which each of these systems, each of these groups, you could say, but they actually <laughs> no, shouldn't think of them as groups, but as systems of communication. Uh, which, which ties them together and gives them a particular view on also on the on, on on an outside world, which you might think of as shared, but each system has a different perspective on what's going on because of what the internal processes of information, of perception, of observation, of information processing. So, so in terms of this levels, these self-reference so closure, we have we have various levels of self-reference. That's recursion on the level of the element, they always tie together with others, reflexivity on the level of process and self-reflection on the level of the system itself. So the system becomes always a system properly, actually only when it knows itself, when it gives itself a name. So, you know, let's say a certain profession, the medical profession, the doctors, the medical doctors, there is a name, there's something where you can, where you can also, you know, and they have an association that's also important that they have a science, they have a code of conduct, but there is a name to hook onto and architecture has also a name. These disciplines and discourses and or an organization has a name, you know, this is um, the architectural association, etc. So you can talk about what what's belongs to it, what's germane to it. So they're all self, they all have self-reflection. All social systems have self-reflection at a certain point, except if, if you start with an ephemeral little uh, conversation that builds up, it maybe doesn't have a name yet, but a certain, somebody's coming and say, no, 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 leave us alone. Then it's us. And then you maybe you'll find a name later if it's recursive, you know, it becomes a kind of Sunday uh, little seminar and it becomes, gets a name. So, so, so that's kind of self-reflection, an incredibly important uh, aspect, uh, which, which, which is non-trivial. So, And so that, that means that you have the self-referential closure, this is kind of metaphor of a boundary, and then there's an outside, the rest of society, or in fact nature, which then within that, once you're within that, you, you, you perceive that outside in a particular way, which is specific. And this kind of, there's a certain filtering. I mean, certain things are totally irrelevant and not perceived in there. And I loved, um, Luhmann had this metaphor of the U-boat, uh, you know, in, uh, in which 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 is kind of vague, kind of is a strong boundary, self enclosed, and there there's very little openings, maybe an an echo a radar or something, which and the world around it is only what what comes in through those uh, instruments, highly filtered, and then processed in particular and responded to because so the world kind of uh, um, becomes this kind of a cr nearly the kind of cre creation of the system. Uh, it's niche where it needs to know also, it's a bit, you can call it the analogy is kind of particular species in, in, in ecological niches, what they perceive and don't perceive, it's of course has to do with what they require to interact with. It's kind of survival uh, uh, requirements as well. And similarly, the thinking is in, in system theory. So so then, and then this kind of, anyway, I want to, um, the system environment distinction is very, very important. And it also, you know, you then learn to self distinguish put the name, you have a boundary process, you keep saying, hey, hey, stay, that doesn't belong here, go away. <laughs> you know, uh, we don't respond to that. As well as, uh, you know, oftentimes, uh, in, uh, and then we'll come to that later, the system environment distinction re-enters the, in the system, the way it uh, uh, distinguishes uh, internal and external reference in its own processes. Um, okay, so, we're now hitting already into, and then communication is a complex 
it's an elemental event, but it's quite complex. It presupposes already, always already the system. And so this, it's, you know, you can say from Derrida, you can learn the communication isn't what just freestanding what it said. There's a kind of, that would be metaphysics of presence, that the meaning of what you said is maybe in what you think at that point. Uh, no, 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 no. The meaning is, 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 you know, in the, what's absent, all the possibilities and the system of possibilities from which you've selected this communication. So it depends on all the other possibilities, which are actually uh, uh, representing the system. That's one thing, but there's also as these three moments of impartation, information, understanding, it's always, it's, 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 it's some kind of response, or anticipation of response and immediately responses as always is part of it as well. Defines and individuates as communication as well. So it's, a, it's an element, which is always already fully relationally complex. So nearly created by the, by the you know, it's this kind of strange part to whole paradox, although the language of part to whole is left behind and substituted by the language of system and environment. Uh, but it's, uh, it's nearly a bit like string theory, although I don't know string theory. What I heard about string theory is that the individual element is super complex and, and kind of nearly a product of the overall. And, and later on, we'll, we, we show how there is a kind of um, logic algebra and graphic symbolism, which, which Luhmann is interested in, and he didn't use so much, but his student, so his students used, you can kind of um, diagram a series of distinction and the way uh, a nested distinction and the way uh, distinctions re-enter in, in, into themselves. And that's, that's the complexity of, let's say, the elemental operation here. Um, so, So specialized communications understood and, and connect to each other only within systems. Communications between systems and or you know things coming from the outside world, they're not really communications because they have these, these, these systems become now self-referentially closed. They're open to influences to they can perceive and and adapt, but they are not the communications are always connecting inside. It's a bit like brain states. Brain is a totally enclosed thing. Yes, you get information. These are irritation of your sense organs, but everything which comes in is, is, is this one thing, is that electric signal. And, and so similarly, that's, you, know, you think of social system there and these U-boats or brains, inverted commas. And uh, so when they communicate with each other, um, there, there's kind of a different phrase. It's not, uh, it's irritations or perturbations. Uh, and you can then also have kind of so-called structural couplings between those, but they're not integrated in, the, in, in a unified system of communications. So because we have this, um, and the capacity to be irritated by perturbation is also spe system specific. So the capacity to be irritated is also a selective sensitivity that they are constituting always uh, the always system specific environment. You know, what uh, it's yeah, the analogy with the ecological niche or what Maturana calls the kind of living systems domain of interaction. Now, of course, there could be influences which destroy you. You didn't consider them relevant and just hit the system and destroy it and break it up. That's different from an irritation which can be, become an observation, becomes, uh, becomes integrated. Uh, so, so that kind of, let's say, um, environment which can deliver irritation to the information process, that's specific to each uh, social system. So you have operation process, you have structures, because the processing of these irritations, they are done with conceptual structures in social systems. Um, anyway, so, I mean, this is still the, the basic algebra of you can see how abstract and general is system theory, and you can apply the same categories to governments and as in as well to, to families, uh, to clubs, or to a seminar. Uh, so, so but we have across all, and then you still distinguish interaction systems: this online seminar, friendships, organizations, firms, universities, courts, government, 
and societal systems. These are these discourses, the sciences, the mass media. These are open systems. They're not have close membership, but they they have a kind of they have a certain sort of discursive rules and conceptual repertoires which are specific, and there we kind of select what can and cannot be kind of recognized as contribution contributing to this. You can't just random random things set will never be picked up repeated so they fall dead they fall off the boundary as it were in these these are very interesting these are the most interesting the societal systems are the most interesting conception and uh, architecture is one of those by the way <laughs> architecture and the design disciplines so so systems uh, yeah there are also some systems maybe which do not fit that way ideally maybe families protest movements etc but we'll come to this so so this Let's say the edifice, the theoretical edifice of Luhmann is, is very intricate and elaborate and has been worked through for across three decades by him kind of reinvestigating each new uh, book. So it is quite worked through, but of course you'll find gaps and, and, and it, it's actually fun to, to build in, into it, uh, and make new connections, uh, build on top of it. And that's what I've done. Okay, so the system environment distinction is very, very important here. So all systems form forms themselves by selectively filtering connection possibilities and thereby drawing a boundary between themselves and the environment. I mean, the environment for most systems is just the rest of society, you know, what everybody else is doing. Of course, it's also, you know, the physical, the physical surroundings, but it's pro mostly, you know, that's also interesting. Uh, we, our lives are, you know, just so much embedded in, you know, depend on communications. The physical reality is so kind of filtered and in the end, all problems become problems of communication. Um, you know, if you, if you, even if, if, you, if you're sick, then you have to communicate, you have to have health insurance, you're part of any these systems and find a doctor and communicate it. If you had an accident, you know, the ambulance, it's all, you know, you hope that somebody is communicating and, and recognizing you. If, you. if you want to fly, you know, to Australia, which is, you know, cutting through, <laughs> you know, it's thousands of kilometers of, of atmosphere is not really a problem. It's a communication problem. Do I have enough money? Do I have my mobile phone to quickly, uh, you, know, um, you know, buy an online ticket? These are all communication. And then I'm kind of, am I friendly? And am I behaving well and communicate well at the, at the security? Do I have a passport? And, and so, and, and then I can do I, do I behave well on, on the flight. So that's all communications. All problems are problems of communication. And I think that's very important. Of course, underlying there, there are, there are kind of material processes, which, 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 but these are usually other communication systems, which, uh, which, which are responsible for controlling them. And, and uh, so, so for, for, on a phenomenal level, all life is just pure communication. So, um, okay, so, so, so this gives you an overview of the kind of a pretty stark and sometimes counterintuitive, um, um, certainly not necessarily common sense uh, cat categories and, and axioms, let's say, of, of social system theory as a general comprehensive theory which and system of concept which encompasses the totality of everything social and then let's say with this and it's actually more of a side effect uh, so you, there comes this kind of a constructivist epistemology and Luhmann says as much I mean epistemology this day I mean actually this new epistemology is a side effect of you know cybernetic second order cybernetic uh, you know um, a new biology research and, and sociological research. But it is interesting uh, to have a look. And that's, let's say, the, the, the philosophical part. So here's what I said, Here, you know, um, the reduction of complexity is also the necessity of each system. Um, and the same is uh, this analogy of the submarine, the selective abstracting representation. And I thought what is quite, the, the, you know, the same you can, firms, organizations like a certain company, they're like a submarine in a sense. So they have internal processes and there's, they're only sensitive to a very few external stimuli. Uh, you know, maybe uh, uh, the market price 
of the product they're working on and maybe some competitors. Uh, that's what they're kind of tracking. This is kind of instrument, very kind of selective. What are, what, how are they observing the world? They're observing the world through kind of market prices and maybe what's happening, uh, the in and out flows, maybe um, <laughs> Um, they're, they're watching, um, uh, you know, maybe their 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 HR department, the sub department mo monitors updates and employment law, and not not much else. And then there are certain processes of dealing with this. Let's say a new update comes in, they get they they're vetted, they 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 look at it. If it's if it's significant, it's 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 communicated up to the the board of directors, and then they make a decision of ignore or deal with it later. So they all have their own time structure, their own references, and their own worldview, which is, you know, so, so I think that's very pertinent. Uh, and the interesting thing is here, so that, uh, so the world is now kind of uh, always system refer referential, system specific. You can't talk about the world in the abstract. Are we talking about the world of the science of physics? Are we talking the world of, um, you know, Facebook as a co corporation was to survive in an economic environment. So, so the system environment distinction is 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 very important for constructivist uh, epistemology. It replaces the distinction transcendental empirical uh, of traditional um, um, uh, epistemology, where we had um, you know the empirical world, and then we had the transcendental subject, which is you know. The, uh, uh, the structure of the human mind and can, the kind of categories through which, but well, it was a universal set of categories through which reality, empirical reality, which becomes itself unknown. So it, it anticipates some of the structure of, of the constructors of epistemology, but there's a major difference, difference, and that is in classical epistemology, let's say Kantian epistemology and post-Kantian versions of that, where the transcendental subject is maybe socially and anthropologically evolved and not necessarily universal, but historically specific, but it's still uni some kind of unity. Unity, and maybe it separates out into Western, you know, Occidental, and then the people trying to, you know, discover, you know, let's say other rationalities in the non eastern centric That's one world. Very radically different here is this system environment distinction because it has the poly contextuality of not of simultaneous multiplicity of perspectives on the world within modern society, within advanced modern uh, world society, some kind of multiverse. And it's not uh, just historical, like you have it with, let's say, uh, Thomas Kuhn, the paradigm shifts, or with Foucault, the epistems. No, simultaneously you have, you know, I don't know, hundreds of epistems. Uh, and, and a set, you know, at least kind of 10, 20 key fundamental epistems tied to various societal uh, subsystems uh, who, 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 and there is no kind of Archimedean vantage point anymore to step out of it. So, which means in a way that sociology is becoming first philosophy. So first philosophy originally is metaphysics, ontology, let's say logic. With Descartes, meditations on the first philosophy, the prima philosophia, uh, you know, this kind of radical doubt, it's, it's the cognition, the cogn ergo to cognitism, the, the uh, epistemology becomes first philosophy, uh, Descartes, Locke, Berkeley, Jung, Kant, Husserl, logical positivism, etc. And then we have the linguistic turn, uh, where it's realized, hey, mm, yeah, it's not, um, it's not a consciousness, it's not uh, the, the subject, it's actually something more distributed, it's language, it's already a big kind of rift in that idea of the knowing subject in, in the world. You have linguistic turn actually starting with the early Wittgenstein and more radical to the later Wittgenstein, Carnap, Quine, Austin, structures and post structures, and they all participate in that. And then I would say it was important that the linguistic turn becomes a linguistic pragmatic turn because li language is not, not a platonic abstract algebra, it is embedded in human practice and only a requires meaning in practical and practice-oriented context, and that's in, in social interaction conditions. So the linguistic pragmatic turn leads in a way to the sociology as first philosophy. Um, 
And the sociology will, of course, which has to understand itself as all social action always linguistically or semiologically mediated. And that is the sociology as a theory of communication. So, and you have the start some of this Durkheim, Heidegger, Gadamer, Made Apple, Havma, Foucault, Luhmann, Shape, and Latour, Fuller, Fuller is social epistemology. So we have we have a number of figures in there, and and the key figures um, uh, where this becomes through very strongly is is I believe uh, in, in 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 maybe in Habermas and Luhmann is most explicit. Uh, so we have then this construct this epistemology where uh, Luhmann is drawing on cybernetics, second order cybernetics, with Hans von Förster's theory of observing systems, and also you know, using uh, Maturana Varela's biology of cognition. So, so observing systems, and that is including organisms, biology of cognition, discriminating, differential response, that's a form of cognition, observation. And it's interesting to assimilate um, also the communicate, let's say the observations which social systems conduct to this, because it's very important also about um, sensitivity, what distinctions you have, discrimination, apparatus, I mean, they are linguistic, and then what the responses are, how the, what the information processing downstream is, is also very important. Uh, uh, because because uh, without downstream processing, the, the, the thing also cuts off. So psychic systems and particularly social systems was our topic, of course, interaction systems, organization, function systems. These are the observing systems. And uh, he's using, I mean, this quoting here, observing means making a distinction and indicating one side and not the other side of the distinction. So he's, he's using um, George Spencer Brown's logic on calculus of distinctions. So it's interesting. There's also the idea that this is kind of, it's a bit uh, complex and vague, but it's a, the philosophy which moves from a philosophy of identity and essences to a philosophy of differences. And you'll see later on, you'll, this comes also through Saussure, there is no positive terms, only differential terms, only systems of distinctions. Um, I mean, Luhmann isn't, re isn't referring to Saussure, but there's a very parallel, let's say, track in, into French philosophy. So knowledge projects, differences onto a reality that knows no differences. That's Luhmann. I mean, the reality, in the reality, there are no categories, there are no distinctions. <laughs> this is, these are protections where we, where certain, you know, we, there's a kind of differential response. Uh, and that's where the differences emerges. And, um, okay, I have to speed up, I guess. Uh, and when you make these distinctions, you, 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 you work with these distinctions and other distinctions you might have had, you didn't use. And that generates some kind of blind spot. But also when you make a distinction, you're not even always aware of the other term, the other side of the distinctions, uh, which, 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 which you carry on implicitly when you call something, uh, you know, call some, somebody uh, a, a, a woman, what, what, you know, what other options you have had would carry on uh, as the kind of the negative that defines the positive as it were. So, um, so that's the kind of blind spot, which is always there and you can overcome it. You can step out and look at what you, how you've observed and what you've said, and then trying to compare that and you kind of undo the blind spot, but while doing this, you generate a new blind spot. So there's always a blind spot. So somebody else can then come in and observe also your latest move and deconstruct, undermine what you've done by revealing the blind spot. You couldn't simultaneously theorize when you're using the distinction. You can't at the same time already questioning the distinction. So that's, Luhmann writes actually an interesting article on Derrida, uh, something like deconstruction as, 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 as an second order of observation, uh, etc. So it's interesting about, and, and this is later on, I'll explain to this, there's a kind of graphic when, you know, and I like that from an architectural point of view, that distinction is actually a drawing a boundary. 
And in, in the real world, I think that's also where it comes from when we learn to classify distinguish when we when we separate out a domain and say, this is the village and this is the wilderness, the outside, the, the marked and the unmarked space. And here within that, we, you know, it's the kind of, you know, Heidegger would say the clearing, you know, building, dwelling, these are ontologically profound categories. And that's coming through also in Luhmann and in, in, in George Spencer Brown, you know, distinguishing through setting a, a boundary and uh, then separating out your animals uh, or, or you, these groups and these social groups from each other, distinguishing them through building walls, literally. But then also it becomes a conceptually tied, hooked onto that. So this is uh, where you have the content you're focused on. The distinction is this asymmetry. You, it's, you can also draw a line. You're saying this, this is what I'm distinguishing from the rest. This is what I focus on. So it's a wall, but the wall with, with, with a focus on content, and that's the context of the distinction. But together they generate a form, which I can then in second order observation, I look at the whole form, the whole distinction, and make a new distinction, but I again have a blind spot here. But that is the idea of second order observation. And what is important, Luhmann realizing that he's saying, you know, a lot of social systems and social communication operates in the mode of second order observation. I mean, it's, it's nearly always implied. I'm already, when I say something, I'm already kind of anticipating how that will be observed. I'm, you know, I'm observing myself doing something through the eyes, also somebody else. And how am I, what will my impact be? Sometimes not, sometimes really kind of, <laughs> I'm just kind of, you know, you know, spitting things out. But most, a lot of times we are operating already, always already in the, in the uh, mode of second order observation. Uh, so, um, evolution has led to a world that has very many different possibilities of observing itself without marking one of these possibilities as the best or only correct one. Every theory that measures up this to the state of affairs must therefore be located on the level of the observation of observation on the level of second order cybernetics. So in a, for theory, it's also very important to be always highly aware which categories, which distinction I'm operating with and stand back and looking at options and you know alternatives and so on. So that's on a very deep level. Um, so the epistemology becomes him herself a rat in the labyrinth that has to reflect on the position from which he or she observes the other rats. So you, you, you're in the rat race, but you have to, as a, as a epistemology, you step out and try to look in the mode of second order observation. But again, the, we're totally unable, we're unable to overcome the, that blind spot, which kind of, kind of, we're chasing, <laughs> we can never chase out of existence. So now, I find this fascinating, George Spencer Brown. So that's the logic of distinctions and which, which Luhmann wants to use. The universe comes into being when the space is severed um, you know, the skin of a living organism cuts off an outside from an inside. By tracing the way we represent such a severance, we can begin to reconstruct which an accessory and coverage that appear almost uncanny, the basic forms underlying linguistic, mathematical, physical, and biological science. We can begin to see how the familiar laws of our experience follow inoxidably for the, from the original act of severance. So an attempt to distinguish different things in a world where in the first place, the boundaries can be drawn anywhere we please. That's the, uh, so, uh, but then the universe cannot be distinguished from how we act upon it. Of course, it's not totally arbitrary that, you know, we are ultimately, we have to realize in a material world, the way we draw these distinctions need, need to kind of uh, be safeguarding us and empowering us of intervening and navigating. But still, there's this kind of paradox. We be probing, and if there is resistance and bad effects, we have to try other distinctions. We don't have the thing in itself uh, uh, at our hand. 
And I think what's fascinating is that if you look at the, the Saussure's general course in linguistics, we find uh, the similar idea, this idea of dissecting. Your language is discretizing and classifying and categorizing. A, in, in his view, this is a diagram directly from, from his text, I mean, maybe more, nearly the only diagram. Um, the, the, the plane of the signifiers below is the world, which is, you know, knows no distinctions and is this kind of mush where, where you can come in. But the interesting thing is that you, when, you, when you start bringing in words and categorizing names, and that's just sounds, you're confronting sounds with, with instances in the world. And uh, then they, you could use those words to cut and, 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 and build up kind of these regular uh, classifications, but the words themselves, interestingly, are a the plane of signifiers is itself fluid, so in, and that's on the level of phonetics. I mean, if you listen to Chai, somebody speaking Chinese, you it's a mush because you don't know the meanings, you don't you can't distinguish one syllable from another. You, one word from another, they sound all similar. And so you need to, you need this kind of correlation that mutual reinforcement so that the, the word, and also of course, because of the, the contextual firming up of which word it actually was, this kind of listening comprehension must be aided by meaning comprehension. Anyway, that's just a bit of a side, but the the, the, the image here is that, one, that there is this kind of amorphous world which is structured through the interactions, communicative interactions through with linguistic tools. Um, and that's, um, I think, you can read it, I will not read this here, but, but the, Saussure, the interesting thing is here that we, we are slicing it up, but the, the, the knives are a system of knives always. So there's, there's a, um, a, it's not an isolated incident. It's always a system where the place in the system determines the meaning. So we don't have positive meanings. We only have differential meanings. And where these are complementarily defining each other. So that's, this graphic kind of shows quite nicely. So for instance, with the color spectrum, uh, we think it's so clear, it's so crystal, crystal, and we know that it's kind of a bleed, but, we get used to it, but in reality, there's different languages dissect this differently. And therefore the meaning of each depends on where the others are and what the others are. So it's always as a group, they, uh, as, a, as a, you know, a little subsystem of totality of the same can give meaning to each. And you can see that they're, they're not necessarily uh, uh, self-evident. And the, similarly, you can find in different languages, this is here, for instance, um, it's unfortunate there's no English, but in German, Baumholzwald, this is tree, wood or timber and forest. And in this kind of range in confronting, let's say the world of uh, uh, forests, different languages slice this up differently. So there's a, that's the incommensurability thesis because you, you cannot translate anymore because there's no equivalent of what in German, nor in any, nor in Danish, nor in Italian. And there's no equivalent of tre in Italian, nor in, in German of the Danish tre. Anyway, so <laughs> because the, it, is a, it is a function, not of reality imprinting and forcing us, but it is the it's the social system, the system of activity guided distinctions. So the linguistically needed activity that that of you know relevance criteria, and of course in the end we have survival criteria, and so on, which which imposes the structure, and each social system, each pragmatic context purposes, agenda, survival criteria play a role in the niche <laughs> requirements, the, the constitution of the organism in a sense, in this sense, it's the social organism that determines the, um, 
the, the, the categorization and distinctions which 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 the, which the world. So it's purely differential, and concepts are defined not positively in terms of their content, but negatively by contrast with other items in the same system. And that's why I said this is this kind of, and when you don't see those others, that's the blind spot you're forgetting. And, and the blind spot in a sense is double. When you say uh, Baum, when I say Baum, the blind spot is that I don't have in view necessarily uh, what I what I exclude in this case, but also don't have a view that I had, I had maybe other distinctions uh, uh, where I, I wouldn't um, have used that word. So, and in Wittgenstein, we also have that awareness. A sentence is assigned within a system of signs. It is a combination of signs from among several possible ones. And in contrast to other possible ones, one position of the pointer, as it were, in contrast to other possible ones. So. So when you just say something, and you, you gotta be you gotta be aware of all the positions of the pointer, but then of other instruments with other, um, let's say, uh, pointer logics. Anyway, this is the um, some some I photographed off some you know pages of George Spencer Brown's The Laws of Form. Let a state be distinguished by the distinction be marked with this mark of distinction, and he calls this side the marked state and the rest the unmarked state. So unmarked state, marked state, distinction, the whole thing is the form. And that's one way to, let's say, visualize, conceptualize uh, what it means to have distinctions. Of course, it's not, they're not isolated, they're systems of distinctions in the end. And anyway, he's doing this, uh, builds an axiomatics and builds a, 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 a whole calculus. So this, with this one, and it's quite abstract. He can represent arithmetic. He can represent like Boolean algebra. He can represent, uh, sorry, like algebra, like Boolean algebra. And he can represent arithmetic as well as propositional logic with the same kind of graphics and abstract terms similar to Boolean algebra using symbols of arithmetic for, for logic, etc. And I'm just, <laughs> it's not for you to read this in particular, but it is quite interesting. The interesting thing here is that also that he's claiming that it's quite visually, you can read off the, let's say, truth of a proposition easier than here. We come, it, it, it is a kind of intuitive visual tractability of the uh, truth value and of the inference correctness. Anyways, the way it works is you, you say color red, you, you know, yeah, it's actually distinct from everything non-red in a particular system that's the indication and the rest of the colors is the context or the unity of difference of different what 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 the way um, Luhmann calls this uh, and then the whole thing is called the form so so you have man woman person but maybe man versus animal is is the, is what you mean so you need to think when you use a term there might be there are different terms if they have different opposites carried on implicitly mean mean by this anyway so so um, with this in mind that these distinctions are to be relativized in a poly contextual world, you can't just be bullied into a self evident distinction and confronted with, you know, a, you know, uh, uh, binary logic, basically. So he is sub basically using Gontrad Gunter to overcome binary logic. So transclassical transjunctional three value logic is proposed through Gunther and that's what Luhmann also wants to integrate. So, um, so the logic of transjunction does not distribute logical values but systems of values. So there's actually, you have now a third option basically. In classical logic, there were only two values, either true or false. There's an affir of a proposition, affirmation or negation. And there's this kind of exclude, law of excluded middle. The meaningful sentence is either true or false. You didn't, you're not given any other option. So that's why you can be bullied into these alternatives. You know, uh, and no. So transjunction trans logic operates with the three logical values. So there's, yes, affirmation, negation, but there's also rejection where you simply say, we know that. I mean, we, we got to some sophisticated 
debaters know this, that you simply reject the, the false framing. You don't fall for the back culture. <laughs> you say, no, you, you fr it's the wrong question. It's the wrong frame. It's the wrong distinctions. Uh, you know, so, so if you are, you know, you, 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 are you a man or a woman? And then you can say, well, no, I'm rejecting that frame. And that's the rejection value. That's the kind of third value. What is interesting is Gunther, and it's not that Luhmann is using it in that way. I mean, Gotthard Gunther has, has a kind of developed a whole kind of uh, algebraic formalism of this kind of three value logic. Um, okay, I think I'm, I'm, and so you see that some of these, um, okay. There is in this diagram. So when you make a distinction, you 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 not only do you have the opposite, which is carry on. Let's say if you use a concept, you should. The Lumen reminds that all concepts are distinctions. You know, it's a sphere within as well, and it's not. You know, there's 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 always one or several opposites or alternatives. You could either have in a dichotomy just one or you. You know, it's red and non-red, and there are many others, and they and together they they under some kind of over. You can maybe point to the unity of difference in a kind of an overarching category. So we speak the world, speak of the and in the end, the world um, is is in Luhmann's theory the unity of the difference between system and environment. Um, so he's using that idea as there's this distinction and there's always, and so you have to remember, you, I can always ask you, first of all, which distinction are you using when using a concept? What's the opposite? What's the unity of that distinction or the unity, unity, unity of that difference? Like, can you ask you that? And then I can ask you perhaps which other forms of distinction could, could you have used? That will be a kind of, let's say, epistemologically sophisticated frame of mind to, to debate. So, but in terms of, so he's applying this to his own uh, logic and his own system as well. So we'll speak of the world to designate um, the unity of the difference between system and environment. We speak of reality to designate the unity of the difference between knowledge and object. We speak of meaning to designate the unity of the difference between actual and impossible. So he's, he's, he's using that concept and I've just written them down like this world system environment and system environment is is a key distinction obviously for which subs which which is different from uh whole part relationships actually they, although within the system you have a series of subsidiary subsystems where the where the system environment distinction reoccurs in layers inside the system but it's different from part to whole. and then there's this kind of strange thing where where yes where you have this kind of re-entry of the Puts the system and time distinction within itself, um, and then within each system, you can have a series of subsystems, but also you can have an external reference and an internal reference. And I come to that with examples now. Uh, when you have the re-entry, and when you have the reflection of the system and time distinction, um, in, it's kind of implicitly reflected through terminologies inside the system. The, some of them which refer to the external reference and some to the internal reference, to internal operations or external operations. So I, I should have swapped that here like this. Sorry, I get. And here you can see that Dirk Becker has used some of those uh, conceptual structures, nested distinctions with nested re-entries to, to grasp some key, the constitution more complex terms. Okay, guys, I'm sorry, I'm running longer than I thought. I will just try to uh, speed up a little bit when it comes to the theory of modernity, uh, you know, which is developed in a way in, in, the, in the dialogue with Habermas. There's of course also both of them have the critical engagement with postmodernism and uh, post-structuralism. And there's a kind of habermas luhmann debate uh, where there's a kind of ping-ponging of major publications, they refer to each other. There's also a shared publication which came out of when they both were at Frankfurt. Um, 
there's two things which are important when it comes to the theory of modern society in Luhmann. We have to accept the modernity means to accept the society without natural order, without destiny, without happiness, without solidarity, without equality, without reason, without consensus, without control center, without address for complaints and political, uh, let's say, transformations. So there's no, no, no citadel you can storm and, and, and revolutionize and without full self-transparency. So it's, it's a kind of bleak, maybe realistic appraisal. And he's saying um, society, yes, it's that which encompasses all the other subsystems in society, but it doesn't have a, a unified address. It, does, it used to have, and the stratified societies at the peak of the pyramid of the stratification, you had a concentration of all power, of all wealth, of all the determination of what's truth and false and knowledge and ideology, you had the kind of apex and a very small group uh, controlling, um, let's say, everything that was an address and you could storm the citadel and substitute, um, but no longer. And, and but also the, the, the theory which I'm following now, he's sort of quite self-reflective and he's saying, hey, you know, this is the perspective of one subsystem in this from within the sciences uh, from sociology, but it was also not presented as an apodictic truth, but it's a, there's a, a series of contingent few design choices he's made and which have certain consequences of how one, can, one kind of works and develops the conceptual apparatus, what becomes visible now, which wasn't visible before, maybe what falls off the site as being less relevant and less important. And so he's reflecting also, and, and I do that the same when we, when we craft these kind of theoretical edifices, it's not the truth, it's just something you want to buy into and continue to work with because you find it's revelatory, you find it helpful and, and, and useful. And you can show you oftentimes which choices, you know, which design choices he made, and where he has substituted, made a category from a tradition with a new concept and so on. So it allows you a bit into that theory design process and this contingency of the theory. And, um, and the main thing is, well, actually, and this comes later, I have, it's just a summary page, I can continue with this. Um, the important thing is also that it's all social system, but, and it now it's world system, world society. Don't think of society as Germany or England. You know, the sciences are global communication systems. We are all globally networked. I mean, architecture is world architecture, cinema is world cinema, the mass media operating globally. Um, the economy is a world economy. So all of these are world systems, world function systems. Um, uh, yes, there's some degrees of separation when it comes to legal systems, but there's also, you know, global arbitration and, and global choice of jurisdictions. It's a system itself. When you when you when you operating as a multinational corporation, etc., there's no privileged description of the world, um, no universally shared self description. There's this kind of inherent polycontextuality uh, from each system, from each perspective, it unfolds differently, and there is there's no way to, in, in, you know, and he's saying it's not only really science, it's not only really sociology, which now kind of uh, it gives that unit universal uh, perspective which everybody has to buy into uh, so he's not saying that so there is no control center no final address no privileged perspective perspective the system observes itself uh, as a distinct from its environment as through self demarcation and gets irritated but each in its own way so and that's only in modern society that becomes that condition. In all the societies, things were more simple. And he is, he's, so his, his theory also has a theory of historical phases, how we got there, historical evolution, periodization. So, and the key category here is modes of societal differentiation. So he's saying segmentation, there was originally segmentary differentiation. That's basically when you have a small tribe, tribal unit breaking off into two tribes, three tribes, each tribe could never be more than 150, 200 people. They had to found new tribes all the time and there was a kind of segmentation of maybe they've still formed some kind of loose society, 
were segmented into different tribes. There's no integration necessarily. Then there was center periphery that maybe one of those became a bit more important and the other ones were satellite and certain functions accrue in, in some kind of center and in some kind of city countryside or center periphery differentiation. That's on a slightly more evolved stage. Then all the big civilizations, all the big, um, where you start to also have literary, I mean, writing and urban centers, that's stratified orders, all the archaic societies, feudalism, all the way to modernity. These are stratified societies. I mean, highly, everything has to do with hierarchical levels. And every, every positioning is exactly in a minute hierarchy. It's not only, you know, uh, uh, nobility and commoners, and clergy, let's say, uh, nobility, clergy, uh, commoners, peasantry, there's, there's many other levels. There's, of course, also the craftspeople. Nobility is a minute subdivision, and where you stand is, is defining you whole, wholly and, and everything you do or don't do. Anyway, so, but there's, a, you, there's an apex which still de delivers authoritative self description of society. There's one, there's one fulcral point, Archimedean point. Functional differentiation is the latest stage modernity, not anymore. So, and you compare that with Marx, it's interesting. So you start with Marx, segmentation, primitive communism, slave holding society, the center periphery differentiation, feudalism, capitalism. Luhmann doesn't have another stage. Functional differentiation, and I think there's Becker tried to say network is a more fluid network society, there are, I think, within functional differentiation, there, there will be further periodizations. But anyway, there's not going to be that big shift to something else like socialism, closing the loop to primitive communism. But anyway, they, they're, quite, they're quite kind of interesting. Here we're talking about privileging the economic, uh, the, the relations of production and property. And here it's more, it's more general, more abstract, uh, let's say, periodization. And modern functional differential society, it's not that we don't have any segmentation, center purity or stratification, but it's dominant. Functional differentiation became ever more dominant and is now the dominant one. Uh, and there are some other subsidiary roles. So for instance, in the modern economy, you have different industries that are parallel. They're functionally differentiated. They're not ordered into a hierarchy. There's no one more important than another. You can say, um, um, that, you know, and, and then there are various firms within each and they are um, um, parallel. But inside the firm, you sometimes have some degree of hierarchy, some kind of command and control, although there's also more functional differentiation internally as well. So, uh, and then you have also center periphery, the orders still, still happening, but functional differentiation is absolutely dominant. And uh, so, so, so that's very important. And um, so, so on the level of primary societal subsystems, he develops this concept of the function systems of modern society. It's something called the great function systems. So they are autocratic systems, they're self referencing closed. They are parallel, they're not ordered into a hierarchy. Um, and each function system evolves and distinguishes itself in relation and response to a particular societal, a singular societal exigency, a particular problem or functional requirement of society, which was dealt with earlier as well, always already, uh, but which now kind of uh, leads to kind of specialization of that kind of part into a unique single function system. And, you know, and that's uh, what we get. So for instance, the separation in a way of the political system from the legal system. When you develop, when we, we of course, the, the king used to be also the judge and the legislator and the, 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 the you know, let's say the, 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 where the concentration of wealth is, is organized. And there was no distinction between national accounting and, and the, the, the courts accounting, et cetera. So you start to have this differentiation and, and, and also, of course, through the clergy science, I mean, that there was ideology and truth were, were, were in a stratified top-down way. Uh, education was done in the family and et cetera. There was no mass media. So, so we, we, what we're finding here is we have this process of differentiation. That's not specific to Lewin. We have, that's the kind of story of sociology, very important, you know, in the works of, of, of Max Weber, for instance, which, which also is, 
a mechanism which then now allows more for the rationalization of each of these systems and internally, uh, you know, functional differentiation of the political apparatus with particular offices, the, bureaucrac the, the bureaucracy is, is both hierarchical but also functional at the same time. Uh, anyway, so, so what we have is this is a key uh, element in the picture of modern society and that these domains are self-referentially closed. Their own categories, their own and their own purposes and their own agenda and protocols of interaction, and what belongs, what doesn't belong, what they respond to, what they ignore. So there are autocratic systems and they are operating in parallel. So it's not that the political system are listening it here in the front, but there is no hierarchy whatsoever. Political system cannot interfere with, uh, let's say, uh, you know, the courts. The Supreme Court is an independent autonomous system. It's division of powers, if you like, and also in the economic systems. They cannot control, they're trying sometimes, and increasingly cannot um, interfere with economic processes. They have their own logic, their own rule, and so on. There's interventionism, but it's kind of losing game. Same with education, mass media, art system, independent media is critical, important, uh, etc. So, so, and they're all of their system. Uh, and in a way, it's interesting that they all coordinate and reorder innovatively all communication. So, all communication is somehow served and framed and coordinated through what these function systems deliver. I mean, the political system delivers collectively binding decisions. The legal system stabilizes normative expectations. So Luhmann focused on the, the way it kind of, you know, how, when are we using the courts? I mean, uh, you don't want to use it more than three times in your life because it kind of eats you up. <laughs> so, so, but you're relying on that there is a sanctioned back normative order. So that, that, that then you can rely on others respecting that. So you can start expecting a lot of things. So it's stabilizing expectations. Anyway, I don't want to go through all of them, uh, uh, what their particular functions are, but they're quite different in their functions, obviously. The education system is now, it used to be just, you know, free for all or in the family. And now it's, of course, systematic schooling, for, you know, even from kindergarten to school, so you, all the way through socialization and, and the development of career credentials, etc. Anyway, and, and the mass media is interestingly, we need them, we need to be in touch. They somehow deliver something like a shared worldview, where you catch, we all live in that same world where you know Trump was elected under Trump, or now it's the Biden, the Biden administration. That's everywhere wherever you're in the world, you or in the world of you know COVID or post-COVID. We need to the mass media puts us all onto the same page. Shared values. And but the interesting thing is mass media also includes things for well, Luma, including the TV series, movies, and so on, where we also learn new sensibilities and new ways of, of being alive. And so we also living in we're all living in a world where, where we've been watching kind of sex in the city and you know, and the whole of China is learning from sex in the city. <laughs> anyway, so 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 these are the function systems, and architecture is one of them. And and they coordinate all communication via spatial visual framing. And there are actually some, so Luhmann didn't talk about architecture. Uh, he, I mean, he, his list isn't complete, it's an open list. Uh, uh, counseling and coaching, I think, engineering technology, there they're, they're, they're more one could define and develop. And, um, and, and I mean, it's a highly improbable evolutionary achievement, race, you know, that, as I said earlier, the law, the power, truth, and wealth are all concentrated at the top. And if you, this kind of unnerving independence, self-referentially autonomous, I mean, each one, of course, responds and adapts to what others are doing, but in their own way, under their own auspices. So we as architects, we respond to the fact that there is now, you know, it's a more of a free market environment that, or that there is more individualism and that there's, that there's new technology spreading everywhere. But it's, we, how do we, our discourse, we, the professionals, the academics, the discourse, we collectively are forging the response, developing and, and developing that new, let's say, for instance, focal style, hopefully, or not, which, which adapts to all of that and, and, and so on. And in, in the same with the legal system, there's new kind of sensitivities and new problems, and it's the lawyers and legal scholars and legislators and 
uh, in special uh, committees and the courts who are uh, you know working through that and nobody can tell you know um, uh, interfere really with that so that's this it's an unnerving condition but if you try to reintegrate all of that you get actually this kind of aggressive totalitarianism that's what communism was trying to do communism trying to so let's say to to to, to kill the independence of the economic dynamics of the way is the free kind of market and capitalism and, and free stock market dynamics, as well as the free development of the sciences and the free development of also political science, the free development, the independent development. I mean, nobody can, the politicians are not in charge of scientific truth. I mean, it's a totally self-referentially, uh, uh, you know, self-organizing and self-policing, self-evolving system. And uh, the communism had to fail because it, it the enormous complexity and degrees of freedom and adaptive innovative strengths you have this kind of divided system as it were was killed so so modernity delivers dramatic evolution and acceleration precisely because of this differentiation the result so that the differentiation of the function system set these domains autonomous the result in self-selective adaptive openness via self-referential closure, so it's openness through closure, um, you know, adaptive openness, so you choose what to respond to in important things which you find relevant, and then you quickly adapt to that. That allows this evolution to be untethered from the older lockstep, where everything had to be tied to the hip, as it were, with each other. So each independent realm is now geared towards rapid innovation, and you can feel that. So the the, the modern economy is the market competition economy. It's this very dynamic, very kind of innovative, innovation driving. Democratization of the political system means that you have competition between political parties, you have a little kind of voter engagement, everybody can come in and also establish lobbying groups and petition and demonstrate and all of that. And that accelerates some kind of the information processing of what the various agendas and dreams and requirements are. Positivism in the legal system means you don't have natural law or God-given law. It is clear, we said, okay, it's legislating and it, it, you know, everything is up for grass. Everything can be reformed, changed, updated. Uh, constructivism in the sciences, there is not some kind of, you can, you, can, you can kind of reject the framing and have a paradigm shift with a new framing and you can have these scientific revolutions and advances. So, uh, abstract space making architectures. You don't have palaces and churches and, and uh, symmetry and proportion. You have, we are space makers and space makers can take any form. So there's all of these self conceptions and characterizations are in each system, radical innovation because they also are set loose from each other to do that. I think it's an enormous advantage, but the unnerving things, the uncanny thing is that poly contextuality. So with modern functional differential society, the unity of the world and of society dissolves into a multiverse of co-evolving system specific incommensurable perspectives. Because yeah. they, and that's the important part, each with its own agenda, problems, priorities, et cetera, and with its own description of the world and uh, of society. So, so compare that with Kuhn and Foucault where it was just maybe a different historical period developed a new perspective. <laughs> No, simultaneously we have this diverging perspective and they're, they're, they can't be integrated. There's no control center. All right. No rationality of the society. Of, as yeah, of um, and so, so I maybe hear rumblings in the background. I, I think we'll wrap up with this. Uh, what this would mean. Um, and actually, maybe I'll stop here. So, so that's, that's there's, there's more, but I think uh, maybe <laughs> I, I pick up another time. Uh, I think we should leave some time for discussion. So, so um, I think that's 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 maybe enough of a teaser to to get you ex interested in this. And I just uh, show uh, just maybe a go to one image uh, where which you to find uh, in my. Uh, books as well, where I try to systematize, uh, let's say, how all these function systems have various internal structures 
in a comparative matrix, the way they can be combined, the way each of them is incommensurable because they have the unique basic type of operation, the unique lead distinction, the particular binary code or dichotomy, which every communication with it has to respond to. They have their own kind of programs of interpreting or proliferating the, 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 the let's say these, uh, the way these dichotomy, abstract dichotomy is filled with concrete life. They have their own medium, for instance, the economy has the medium of money, the politics has the medium of power. And these are generalized mediums. So power you can use for many different things. Uh, you instruct X, Y, Z, like money you can use for X, Y, Z. And it, 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 it helps to structure a large organization where otherwise you would, in traditional studies, would rely on this reciprocity, not continuous asymmetric instruction and subaltern following. So you need, you need a specific medium and motivation power for it. You have rule of law as a medium. You have actually space and 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 and, and modeling and simulations as medium and architecture to make to make um, uh, let's say uh, complex demanding communication acceptable and probable. So I leave it with that. And all of these have, by the way, there's one more point. All of these and that's very important. All of these function systems have reflection theories. They have academic disciplines and titles. They're not necessarily sciences. They are self-descriptions and critical reflections on their purposes. So you have architecture, you have architectural theory, but we are not a science. You have jurisprudence and, uh, and legal discourse uh, and lawyers as professors in academic disciplines, they're not scientists necessarily. Uh, political theory, you have pedagogy uh, in the terms of the education system. You have, of course, you have uh, um, business theory, MBAs and economics for the economy. So, so all of these function systems, they have their own unique, um, what Luhmann calls reflection theories. And for the sciences themselves, your philosophy of science and epistemology who are critical, engaged in critical self-reflection, self-description, self-critique uh, uh, and an enhancement, which is also a very important factor here. And that also started modernity where you have, you know, we have the first political treatises, the first architectural treatises, uh, like Alberti, or you have Machiavelli and, and Hobbes and, and Locke. Uh, it, it, education comes early with, with Pestalozzi, also 18th century. Uh, legal discourse is very old. So, so these things, by the way, and this is things, modern social differential society, yes, it's full, comes to its full only in the 20th century, but the beginnings are in Shakespeare. Let's say it's the 17th, 18th century. Uh, it, it, is, it is starting to really take over, and, and, and the drivers are this these differentiation of these uh, function systems and their, let's say, uh, theoretical strands, very importantly as well. Uh, anyway, I leave it with that. I leave that uh, picture here for a moment, but uh, let's start the discussion. Or oh, I, I actually stop sharing and open the discussion. Patrick, wow, that was... Um... <laughs> <laughs> that was terrific. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was, uh, what I'm always amazed uh, with about you is, is your incredible energy. You know, the, the fact that you can run a practice with 400 plus people and then also uh, uh, devote so much time to your writing and to thinking about philosophy. But also the other thing I'd say is interesting about you is you, you haven't left behind your origins. I mean, in a way, sometimes, you know, someone like Manuel de Landos starts off talking about Deleuze, but then kind of leaves it, leaves them behind in some sense. And also maybe Michael Speaks has kind of, has almost rejected uh, the work of Frederick Jameson, but nonetheless, you've kept to that, which is really amazing. And given the context of everything else you do, it's quite astonishing. And I was just thinking, well, why is it we haven't heard about Nicholas Lerman so much? Um, I think in many cases, a lot of these kind of, Theorists have to have a kind of some kind of person promoting them, you know, an apologist yeah. in some ways. You think about, you know, I don't think I'm not sure whether Walter Benjamin would be quite so well known had it not been for Hannah Arendt and, and other champions who, who kind of like promoted them in some ways. So maybe it's just maybe you're going to have a huge impact on. Uh, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> well, I tell you, I mean, it's interesting. Uh, the um, I mean, the, the in Germany, he is as well-known as Habermas, and there have been these kind of sparing partners and titans, and he's been a lot in the media in, in, in Germany, and uh, he's kind of maybe won over the sociology the field uh, to some extent, even more, and uh, there's even a sense that he kind of uh, 
with respect to Habermas, Habermas was, done, was more picked up globe internationally, maybe McCarthy in America, he went early to Stanford. I mean, uh, and, and it was lecturing and outside. Luhmann also went out, but, and then the translation of his works, because of these lesser international uh, connections, Habermas works got nearly translated very quickly in all of them. And Luhmann's work got translated much later. And then he also passed away earlier when, when, when Habermas is still, is still out there. So, so that just hampered a little bit that, that progress. And, but there's a lot out there. I mean, there's some discipline is very prominent uh, in particular international relations, curiously in the in, in legal theory is very, very uh, prominent in organization theory, uh, uh, but globally as a global figure, yes, not so much, but it's in gestation, I think, because they're still publishing major of his works in recent years, uh, even this main double volume Keystone work was published very late, only in the late, kind of, you know, a few years ago, and there's still more to come. So, and I see if you go online, you see a lot of uh, scholarly engagement uh, catching up with these translations. And, and, and so I think that's been a major, major, um, I don't know if it's, if it's how, if he's going to be ever that big as an international figure as, as Habermas, I don't know, but I think his, 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 his star will keep, will keep rising for a while because there's very little out there which competes on the level of, and you haven't seen the full, and I have to come back maybe to give you the, the last, the, the next third there, uh, how, how, how impressive and rich of in, with respect to detail uh, it is also becoming. So um, I've got a, one question, but I know that there are a couple in the, in the chat that are going to come up. I think uh, Marissa Bell and uh, Matt both have questions, and there's also some questions from in the chat from YouTube. But let me start with 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 my question, then we can go on to Matt yeah. and Marissa Bell. My question is is just simply to say it was more an observation in some senses. I mean, I think what I came what came across is a fantastic lecture, wonderful in terms of mapping out all these different sort of trajectories and influences and so on. In sense, I I came out with the impression less of the kind of this interconnected systems and more about the notion of distinctions and how do you kind of formulate those distinctions or uh, um, between different things and, but it struck me that maybe that the, the example you gave of the submarine wasn't perhaps the best one the reason why i say this is is in, in the submarine which was a membrane in some sense which was filtering out you know, certain things in a certain way it struck me that that was a bit of a kind of like a static model in, in, and I, I would have thought that maybe a kind of more biological sort of model um, of of whereby almost you get these kind of cells that are bifurcating or indeed you know aggregating so four cells become one bigger cell in a very dynamic um, process over time that to my mind especially given the kind of varela connection and so on it's, it's to do with a kind of a more biological model might be more a more appropriate one than a static one like a submarine is that, is that yeah fair? yeah I, I agree with you absolutely you're absolutely right and and uh, you know the energy of the organism and the the membrane and, and also the evolving uh, um, uh, that the, the autopotic system can can evolve through various stages and also change its internal structures its sensitivities and so on and that's it is also interesting to trace and actually that's been my project also i mean when, when you look at um uh, architecture and as well as um, I'm, I'm, I'm working also on the on the economy and its recent uh, transformational stages. So that's very it's very true. And actually, in my book, I never use the U boat analogy, but it, it just I just was reflecting about it because when I first, I mean, I heard about Luhmann uh, uh, in the 80s when you know, because of the I was into Habermas and he's written together with Habermas and I never paid a lot of attention to it, but. In the in the in the nineties, I came across this newspaper article where 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 they used that U U boat analogy, and, and somehow something clicked and something went. So I I was I was just triggered my and uh, uh, leap into Luhmann uh, in that in that article, which was was talking about uh, uh, this as a, as an interesting metaphor at the time was looking at a lot of organizations which have very, very these, as I said, these very, very narrow connections with an outside world, the various parameters they track, and then not only, but also how they track it and what the response mechanisms are. And then, and then reading, reading uh, re that led me then, of course, yeah, to, to, 
to the biology of cognition. But yeah, a totally point taken. But I found it a very striking image because the, the U-boat is so hermetic. Uh, and that, that, that picture, that emphasis of that, uh, um, um, that you know, whereas of course, an, 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 an creature has you know has a whole sensitive skin and eyes and, and lots of other organs and many, and and then the U-boat functions with this kind of <laughs> in a solid steel shell. Anyway, it's a good point taken. I just want the image quite stark and 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 stimulating. Okay, so let's let's <laughs> ma uh, uh, let's Matt. Should we uh, can we unmute you or can we get you to ask your question? Hello, um, hi, and and thank you uh, again. It's uh, I mean it's so much, and I'm we're we're grappling with this. It's it's amazing, and that chart you were showing at the end, I've I, I screenshotted it. So I'm going to hang on to that. Chart. <laughs> you can find it in my book. Uh, it's in, maybe I'll get the book and say. <laughs> but I, I just was wondering, and this is maybe a, a, just a prova. That's my, That's me. That's me. I'm more German than Luhmann in synth <laughs> the structure. He has never he's never drawn that map. <laughs> I think the thing that I'm taking from this is that is that um, Lumen's sort of trying to, or he's creating this world where everything is, when you define everything as communication and you kind of really break it down and, and abstract it and pull it out to sort of, you know, everything is a system of a system of a system. At a certain point, I get this sense that, that, that such a philosophy will just kind of abstract itself into, into almost meaninglessness. Like, yes, you can take anything and you can then describe it in his terms and that's great but what's the like what's the practical uh point and i was wondering if maybe you could provide a yeah yeah a i mean I, 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 that yeah, I think that, you. yeah well the practical point for me was for instance it's it's really difficult you, it, this is the overall schema and you can try to summarize in this in this table and so on but there's a lot of riches of detail if you go into the various monographs and uh, for me it was very fertile to 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 have that conceptual and many examples. So when, when I've I've read, let's say, the economy of society, the politics of society, the education system of society, and so on. So then, kind of, you can see different versions of how these different abstract categories grip and get hold of and make sense of a lot of empirical material and what one knows, also what one what one exercises experience and understands and makes sense of it. And that helped me to build up slowly. To, to use it to re-describe the self-description of architecture. And, um, and that's something I'm gonna present in, in, in another set of lectures that, uh, in, in more detail I'm working on. Um, so, so that helped me a lot. You, you can put a lot of flesh on the bone there and a lot of nuance. And, uh, and I think it's just fascinating for one thing, for instance, when I, I was saying that, I'll give you an example to maybe becomes more tangible. Um, so what, what you have in this polycontextuality is that in a way, uh, these, the, these function systems, the same as architecture and the design discipline, they, are, they have um, universal competency, uh, 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 but also exclusive competency and universal scope with respect to all communications. They, 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 they kind of structure and give premise and, and background to all communication. So that means, for instance, with respect to Architecture, so so everything we we do, everything you encounter, you step into a shop, there is some kind of uh, set of legal premises, mm. you know, which which make you make you feel safe. The shopkeeper allows you to come in. What you touch, the camera, everything is legally regulated and controlled. So the legal system is everywhere. And 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 if you say if you look at somebody, you might actually infringe already somebody. You you know you might be insulting them, so there might be a suit coming there or libel or you step you're trespassing you, uh, and and it is getting ever more dense. Uh, it, domestic life, I mean uh, you know uh, etc. You, you might be you, you, you know uh, now you know there is uh, you know, certain words are kind of um, abuse. Uh, there's no it's kind of, the same as with architecture. For instance, we every every element of the phenomenal world we inhabit, every communication is framed by a by a professional designer. Similarly, with uh, so so, the, so all these le legal decisions, the framings are done by legal experts, and they've gone you know and you rely on them in the same as here. So, for instance, design, uh, Zoom here, <laughs> that grid where 
looking at with all the buttons is UX, UI, the graphic interaction designer, web designer. These are colleagues. They're actually, and that's why I said the office of is the office of the design assistants. And when you, when you, in, 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 when in your, you know, the, the, the desk you're on, the, the iPhone, the, the, the laptop, the chairs, the, the home, the shelf, the, the, the street, the street lamp, everything, every, every, <laughs> and the way this is next. So wherever every move you make is a designer's framing of the situation that matters for the communication. Where you are, uh, what, what it, it, it signals and defines the situation, the protocol of interaction is also kind of anticipated and, and, and communicated by this. Anyway, just as an example, uh, the, way this, the way this connects back into, into everyday life, life of every step. Um, um, so it, 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 it's, it's difficult in the lecture. I mean, this is, let's say 15, 15 years of, sure. of reading and thinking and trying to apply it and then writing a book for 10, for 10, another 10 years or overlapping it. Then you, you, you get, they get, there's a lot of flesh on the bone and I can just say, look, as an invitation, it, it, it's quite satisfying. A lot of things fall into place and you gain kind of um, a nanotechnic control mm -hmm. through the systematization and redundancy of use of terms where you, it's an analogy machine, which works very, very well. Um, uh, and that makes you know, all knowledge and all recognition is kind of re-recognition and analogy and, and so on. So I, th I think it's, I know where you come from, it, 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 these abstractions, when I'm presenting them as a, as a grid, as an abstract, they, they, they be kind of, kind of mind numbing and you get vertical and but the whole point is <clears throat> and this is that is what he's able to deliver it comes down because another thing is he said read he wrote a book on love on intimate relationships and love is medium and the way it's different in modern under modern condition very very different mm. and love as passion also historically tracing it so it becomes very kind of intimate personal and but also I find it very kind of um, a revelatory in of course in terms of the deals what we expect what we what we want out of this and it is kind of uh, let's say high powered expectations and, and 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 associations with that which makes it ever more kind of burdensome and and high powered anyway so 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 you can the, the, it's it's an invitation to pick up some of those books and i can i can recommend of course my books and maybe i can recommend something like uh, is an early book on power or mm. the book on love. It That's fascinating. Tangible. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, I particularly appreciate this idea that you can reject the framework as part of the framework yeah. and then thus it can grow. And that, you know, that's extraordinary. I think that's a great thing to take forward. Thank you. Um, th thanks, Patrick. Uh, uh, Marissa Bell uh, also has a question. Um, would you like Marissa Bell to unmute yourself and... Um, Hello. Hi. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Patrick, again, for this wonderful introduction. I, I had not, uh, I didn't know very much about Lumen. In fact, I hadn't heard very much about him. So I really appreciate this as a, as a first introduction. Um, my question actually was uh, sort of you pricked my ears in, in a way when you started talking about philosophy, uh, the, the idea that philosophy was a sort of a framework for steering uh, other societal functions. And, and this idea that sociology could also be considered a sort of first philosophy. And, and, but I was really curious because again, that question of how starts to pop up and how sociology could begin to, to, to have that sort of impact. And my question has to do with whether, um, how, how, how Lumen's relational ontology uh, actually integrates any kind of conversation about uh, discussion about, uh, technology uh, uh, and how it's involved in framing this 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 society. And so, because um, I know that you you talked a lot about sort of linguistic frameworks, but are there other social, I mean, technical systems that he also engages with when he is uh, creating his framework? Um, and that, that was really my, my, my question. Is this a question of a sort of a, a sort of a flash mob or a, a sort of a swarming communication that happens? Or are there more discrete technical, I think you use the word concatenation, discrete technical moves that start to create 
this, uh, this kind of uh, self-image that the society begins to generate for itself. And so, I mean, these are just all questions that I think came up in your, in your wonderful uh, 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 introduction. Yeah, well, thank you. So, so yeah, I don't, I've come to believe that, that um, sociology is first philosophy, at least it, it is, it needs to be, you need to reach a mature philosophy needs to reach, let's say, be also a theory and philosophy of social interaction relation, because that's where meaning is actually grounded and produced. That's the, since the linguistic turn, linguistic pragmatic mm -hmm. turn is understood to also start to reach itself and encompass itself. Uh, and, and, and that's why, you know, I think the, and in the end, I gravitated to figures. The first example of this in a sense is Marx because he is, he is a philosopher in the deepest sense, uh, you know, uh, with, 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 with uh, dialectical materialism and historical materialism and then, but also if, uh, the first sociologist Mm -hmm. But more also, you can find in a figure like like Habermas and uh, interestingly also someone like Foucault is is, is somebody who is, is reaching out into political and social uh, uh, structure and engagement and is also a deep philosopher in terms of the archaeology of knowledge and the concept of the episteme and so on. So that's the, the kind of philosophers I'm gravitating towards. And, and I find, um, let's say, uh, philosophers who, who, who stay in the more, don't reach that looping through the concreteness of of social social life uh, and understand in the stay within the abstract let's say it's a in the metaphysic or in a pure mm -hmm. philosophy of science and epistemology case that's not philosophy in the deepest sense and when i look at figures like some philosophers like graham Harmon, who maybe has ambition to go they haven't reached that is still in a state of immaturity and there these things remain uh, uh, in a sense, kind of, they're, they're hanging free, they're, they're dangling free air, and yeah, and, uh, uh, and so, so, so that's the way I think. Maybe you, in the end, uh, philosophy is is you need to you need to complete loops of reflection, and so it's not only sociology, it's sociology looping through philosophy of consciousness and 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 and, and meaning and language. Uh, Etc. So, so that's what I would say. But it's it's it can't be left out in the word of commerce. Right. And, I, I um, guess I guess my yeah, question. But, but in terms of the, the, the technology, I just want to say yes. There is. I think there's new technologies, um, um, which, so so so, which, is actually fascinating because Lumon wasn't so engaged with, or they weren't too new to be to be. Um, fully engaged with so we, when he talks about the mass media and so on it, there was no social media there was no uh, Facebook and YouTube and and it, all this kind of self broadcasting mm -hmm. and so that's interesting in terms of mass media and the conception of uh, that, that that system of generating some of a shared worldview that that formula still applies to you but I think there's all these interesting new logics if one could maybe look at his book on the mass media and the reality of the mass media and, and see how one would have to rewrite this. But I think also in terms of um, more and more in artificial intelligence systems, exactly. yes. in integrating the way, the way um, so social communication is mediated through these computers and systems, uh, whether in trading systems, automatic trading where, where market exchanges are, are happening between, between algorithms and so on. So this, there's some new things. <laughs> Yeah. Which, well, I mean, which, that's exactly I what think, was. Uh, uh, it's an interesting task to tackle, to to kind of expand or, re, or or see if that if that framework ho holds up. I think it would probably hold up because it 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 it's most kind of uh, developed with with uh, in the kind of complexity theory um uh, agenda but i haven't tested that mentally right. whether it would hold up and what or how one would uh, uh, certain topics uh, well that, i think that that is exactly what uh, sort of uh, uh, there are so many questions that come up that, during your presentation but that one in particular especially you know in this kind of when you're uh, sort of that the great sort of uh, relational diagrams where you're showing his uh, him in his uh, context and also the intellectual history surrounding him at that point 
and thinking about, you know, sort of the relationship with cybernetics and uh, command and control systems. And uh, again, the idea of uh, how this might relate to current, um, current artificial intelligence, uh, you know, how to transpose this, how to make it relevant uh, is really was really what uh, sort of spurred on that question. So it's very I mean, fascinating. I want to, uh, well, thanks for that. I mean, I'll, there's something which I also wanted to mention. I mean, he, he did start discussing technology in particular in the context of risk technologies and the risk uh -huh. society. There was also, it was a dialogues with um, some other German sociologists around this concept. Um, I mean, his initial definition of technology is, uh, it's, it's about the strict coupling of cause and effect, because he believes out in nature, you don't have that. It's only under controlled condition that you have actually reliable cause, uh, cause effect, uh, highly selective. And uh, he also doesn't believe that the, 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 the causality is a, is a meaningful category in the social sciences. And, and right. he is moving into functional, uh -huh. uh, functional uh, uh, structural functional ex modes of explanation, which open up functional equivalences and opportunities, not so much explanation about alternatives. F f you know, when you see how things function and which functions are uh, picked up, what alternative ways of reaching these functions are going beyond. So it's a very different mode, not, not the kind of cause and explanatory mode, more kind right. of functional opportunizing open mode. Right. And, and the question and technology comes to its limit when we, 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 the, the kind of strict coupling of cause and effect becomes questionable. And you have to kind of think about risk, security technologies on top of technologies. You think in particular it was at the time in the 90s when it's atomic energy, mm -hmm. gene technology, uh, there was a lot of doubt and maybe with AI running out of control. So you had, there's a lot of discourse about uh, coping with risk and discourses of risk and the way risk technologies behave differently from traditional technologies. Hmm. And the, he was pointing at the area, at area of gene technology and atomic energy. Um, That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Yeah. So, but I think uh, it will also apply to AI in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Philippe Morel has a has a question. Philippe, do you want to ask a question? Can you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hi, Patrick. Uh, thanks hi, hi. a lot for for the presentation. It's, it, it was just amazing. Uh, I have a question regarding. Uh, I mean, I didn't know George uh, Spencer Brown, uh, the laws of form. It's 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 quite fascinating. Uh, it it reminds me a lot of uh, Gottlob Frege in the uh, 19th yeah. century, and uh, I wondered uh, at some point if there is. I mean, it's it's both at the same time super interesting, uh, but it seems to be almost a kind of pre-computational uh, mode of diagramming uh, the Boolean logic. You know, because at at some point, yeah. at some point, it's so visual, it's so visual that there's no way we can really make something out of that on the computer. So I really wonder. Uh, how, how you consider that. Uh, also, I think this is in relationship, I mean, this is to put in relation with what you said that uh, there's no privileged description uh, of the world, uh, which at some point I kind of agree on a cultural level, uh, even if uh, culturally speaking, uh, we both live in capitalism and uh, uh, in more or less the same society. So it's always difficult to say that there's no privileged description of the world while obviously we share most of the, I mean, most of the things we are sharing are exactly the same. So there is some sort of universality at some point. And also when you say that there's no universal description, including in science, uh, it seems to me that on the contrary, in science, there is some universal description, especially through computation. Uh, and the correspondence between computation and uh, the amount of energy which is required to make uh, a, a computation. So, yeah, if I, uh, uh, my, my question, I mean, it's not really a question, is that uh, I, I would say there is a universal description which is computational, but for sure, and here I totally agree with you, uh, it's very difficult for a human mind to process this universal description because it implies so much complexity and so many parameters that maybe uh, there's only a handful of brains <laughs> in the world, you know, with uh, Einstein intelligence, we can, we can process that. 
So yeah, it's uh, I both have this remarks on the universality of computation, which I believe still applies, and maybe more than ever, and also on the relationship between uh, Frege and uh, Spencer Brown, uh, because because even if I really enjoy this kind of um, experimental notational approach, it seems to me that uh, it's almost pre-computational and that it's very difficult to make something out of that on a computer. Uh, yeah, that's very interesting. So so actually, if you look at, I mean, I started to look at a little bit. Um, uh, George Sensor Brown was, was picked up by a guy called William Bricken. So under the heading of iconic logic and iconic arithmetic, and he's actually uh, there's a whole research program, and I don't know how far this reaches, but that he's trying to go into a, a refounding uh, computational process on this basis. So, so this ties in with, and, and, and Spencer Brown has been also looking at 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 at, at um, logic circuits a lot. I mean, and of course, the connection with Frege is a very straight. It's a very straight line from Frege through Piano Russell. Uh, and in, into somebody like uh, George Spencer Brown, but he he was actually part of this discourse with the cyberneticians, uh, with the um, and and looked at uh, logic circuits and computation. And out of that, uh, through Bricken, you you do find actually new computational paradigms. I mean, these programs, I don't know how far they've reached. I mean, they they're trying to very deeply restructure. A, 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 a computational um, um, uh, systems with going into hardware. So they're developing new hardware based on these logic principles. It's, it's fascinating. I mean, it's not that I can penetrate it fully, but, but uh, what you were demanding is happening and it's, 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 it's a straight line from George Spencer Brown to these projects. Uh, William Bricken is interesting. I'm just, I, I have to have just looked at this, this kind of three volume on okay. uh, iconic arithmetic uh, you know, with subtitles like symbolic and post-symbolic formal foundations, and 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 they are they're going, uh, as I said, into into logic circuits, into hardware, with with the prospect of of of, of you know performance, power empowerment. Out of that, it's quite interesting. Okay, um, but so but coming back to the, the idea of a universe, I mean, let's say uh, of an, a fully. Uh, shared and universal, uh, let's say, comprehensive description of the universe of, of society even, which would be undisputed and would be non-perspectival or in a sense, you need to go back to this. I mean, that's the Marxian view uh, where you're saying it's a universal class. Uh, all our agendas are one. Uh, we, we all have one, one, one agenda, one position, one perspective in the end uh, in the class of society. So, so that's the view, but look, I don't know. I mean, it's it's very touching, and sometimes in my moments of romantic enthusiasm, I I, I catch a glimpse of this. But 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 in reality, I don't think you find it plausible that, the, that such a project would would find uh, you know, let's say, uh, could radiate through and become viral in in, in world society. Um, and be actually and could work. So, so there, there's my skepticism that would, 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 would just into, maybe in a flush of a of a of a of a, of a kind of a romantic exuberant party of an imagined revolution in uh, 1968. Uh, uh, you know, all on drugs as well. But afterwards, we it's going it's going to uh, crystallize out into these into an evolutionary process, not a, a consciously communicated synthesis. It must be an evolutionary process where, where you have this division of labor, this these partial rationalities, which in the end we can rely on. I mean, I'm, I, mean I believe, you know, what I've learned through Hayek, there's a lot of beauty in this as well. And 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 it has it has carried us further than 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 we probably could. I don't think we can top that with the with a big kind of singular. Uh, and I find that I, I, you know, my experience in in, in architecture, of course, in, I think there could be and should be, in a discipline like architecture, you could have a, a unifying discourse, and a, you can converge. You could have strong convergence around a paradigm. But my experience in this is, of course, very very kind of humbling and and frustrating. I'm not giving up, but 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 so so within these 
subdomains and subsystems which 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 have which have uh, which have picked up uh, a particular domain and claiming universal uh, and and exclusive competency like the designers for the phenomenal world they should and could be such such a convergence upon a a description uh, i think uh, i haven't experienced it yet <laughs> i think i have such a description but the, and the plausibility amongst you know designers to cohere them i i believe that but not not across not across um uh, domains and also when i've got all the designers onto the uh, let's say uh, into the movement or at least the a, 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 then then when they go home uh, they have they 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 in terms of their intimate relationships there will, there will be divergence so 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 that's what i believe <laughs> i think it's quite right um but i do think there's one thing of course it's been very provocative and and disheartening when when it comes with respect to the political integration i mean we are world society so of course there are those who are dreaming on you know world democracy world government and and emancipation on a global level through political processes of I don't know, maybe technologies they believe could, you know, liquid democracy and, and, and so on. I mean, I don't know, I don't want to kill it off, you know, but Luhmann was kind of saying, hey, kill this off. Um, um, uh, because also, you know, so, 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 but not in my lifetime. So, um, so we, we have to be more humble and we actually have to, in a sense, um, what I believe is in markets and discourses and that the discourse of protection and the prevention of these false idols and false projects is maybe the best we can do for, for the overall. These, these degrees of freedom, these, the, 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 that the, this autonomy can, can, can be legitimized also through the complexity barrier, which we have to point to saying, and those who want to break through the complexity barrier are actually totalitarians. So, so, so because these tendencies are there, so the economy is being killed right now. The autonomy of the economy, you know, the cap yeah. mar market capital, uh, sorry, so the capital markets are, are you know, you know, distorted. Uh, money is undermined. Um, entrepreneurial freedoms are frozen up. And and in particular, if you compare to the crypto universe, the, the the explosion of innovation and flourishing and 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 what the real economy, the way it's been clamped down by by the political system we're into actually for me therefore is not is actually healthy the lumanian uh, story of of how we've reached there i mean that's the thing he's not a utopian he's just saying you know uh, instead of um critiquing um um and and trying to overthrow and and, and unit unify everybody under the, in this big kind of rush of 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 solidarity uh, he, he is he's showing showing how we've created how we've generated this amazing prosperity this amazing complexity this amazing capacity of uh, uh, through that kind of self-referential closure through this division of labor through this autonomous co-evolution and don't kill that don't yeah, don't oh. don't you know so so <laughs> So of and then that's, uh, uh, let's say um, uh, where where I'm coming from with that, with respect to the, the 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 unified description of the destiny of humanity. But this unified description, uh, I mean, it seems to me that scientifically speaking, we more or less have this uh, this uh, universal description. We also have it uh, on a technical level. Sense but that's only one computer. subsystem. Uh, uh, that, that's so, precisely. That I agree with that. So within within each discipline, there can be convergence paradigm cumulative. You know, you know, yeah. cumulative uh, and convergence and and deepening into into a shared and also an, yeah, encompass an all encompassing description from the perspective, for instance, of physics. Yes, but that's exactly. Not, but that's, that's not why... that's not the, that doesn't tell you where the human project destination lies with respect to a, a supposed potential to integrate a, a politics, economics, law, uh, you know, uh, and culture. I mean, even in terms of money, I mean, uh, the ultimate money is just one bit of information, of course. So, I, I, at some point, you know, I'm looking for. 
uh, I really believe that uh, since we need to maximize uh, freedom, uh, I'm, I'm convinced that, that we have available uh, a universal description of the world, but I don't believe, I mean, it's definitely a scientific and a technological one, but since we also need to maximize individual freedom, I'm not completely convinced by the necessity to look at this in architecture for a universal, um, I mean, either a style or a universal way to- This uh, is more like a paradigm, a description. Let's say, let's call a unified description, uh, um, which we can, look, there is contingency. And the way I'm arguing for this is this, there's, there's, there is, there could be several competing description and each each description and conceptual is of course it's it's to some extent designed but of course designed on the basis of which, of, which has some, of a whole uh, discourse that evolved over centuries with hundreds of authors and then somebody comes along and tries to filter select tweak design integrate and offer that as a self description as a next level in, in compared to let's say what what else you can go to you can go, go back to towards a new architecture and the city of tomorrow, or you go to the autobuses of architecture, or you go maybe to you know the intentions in in architecture with with with, with Norberg Schulz. I mean, there's not many many options. So so you can or you say, oh no, do, I have nothing to do with it. I'm 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 doing my own thing where I'm just looking at Instagram or or looking at. So 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 there's also the question when the, these choices of descriptions. There, there are not so many that have been worked up. And and yes, you, you can do your version. And uh, let's see, see you in 10 years. <laughs> All you, you know, you, you there, there is, it is some kind of buy-in and convergence and then the collaborative dissecting and recombining of a description, let's say, which I'm offering, I'm hoping, and also a movement, parametrism, tectonism, you know, let's say, of course, the discipline is highly fragmented and that's super problematic because we have people in the discipline who work, uh, uh, you know, in the ways they could have worked 80 years ago. Yeah, but uh, even, and, even and that, outside and that, the and that discipline. Would be, that would be, uh, that's why we're such, we're such a backward discipline. That's what you, you don't have that in neither, you don't have that in physics, nor, you, nor do you have that in finance, nor do you have that in the, right. but in, but you know, at the, at the outer fringes of the legal profession. It, it, you it's have also, that in cracks in medicine, but. <laughs> it's not just within the discipline, because in yeah. fact, in fact, I would say probably what makes a difference between what, happen, what happens in physics, uh, as, as you say, in any case in physics, I mean, all people, all, all physics, physics, sorry, theoretical physicists or non-theoretical physicists, they all agree on the latest paradigm. I mean, maybe not on the very latest, but yeah. let's say at least something that was stated 10 or, or 15 years ago, it's now considered standard, of course. And I totally agree with you that this doesn't happen in, in the discipline of architecture. But moreover, I would say that the difference between what, happen, what happens in physics and what happens in architecture is that 95% of architecture is produced, I mean, outside the discipline of architecture, which is not the case in physics. I mean, 100% of physics is produced by physicists, but only 5% of architecture is produced by architects. So yeah, th that's also a very that big difference, the, in the major I would cities, say. Uh, I think that in the, in the advanced countries, uh, it is nearly 100% that is produced by architects. Yeah, but advanced countries and, and advanced yeah. cities still, yeah. still represent not such a big <laughs> part of what is built. <laughs> But yeah, yeah. I mean, thanks for for it's really really interesting. Yeah, this we, we need you. to wrap things up. I, I just want to mention two questions in the chat. We haven't got really time to to, to look at them. But uh, Federico Giacomara, and this comes from the you from following the live live stream on YouTube. One question: Thanks for the speech. If what matters in a system are codes, how do the systems co-evolve? In particular, how do the concept of causality? How is the concept of causality defined, and how do we need, um, and do we need a, a meta language? That's one question. Another point from someone called Artstep. That's the, the 
known to have. Isn't there an inherent tension in Lumen's work of trying to reconcile a super theory of systems and the acknowledgement that human analysis can only happen through distinction or filtering? That's a fantastic question. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, the super theory is simply that, that and that doesn't make it, uh, that, that still leaves the, the edifice contingent. It just means that we should, let's say it's like, look, what else do we have? If you don't want the auto process of architecture as some kind of guiding self-description, uh, what you, you just want to have none or you want to have your grandmothers or you have your, your whatever. So the, similarly, you say uh, uh, the Lumen system may pick it up or not, but one thing we should expect from any alternative system, uh, is, uh, and, and they're all contingent and none of them is, is right or final or, it's just a relative choice, but the ones we should choose, they should, these should be autologically, they should include themselves, they should be have enough theoretical resources to see if they can describe themselves, uh, their own processes and becoming and role and social role, if you have the concept of social role, for instance, and social function, so that at least they not have that blind spot of leaving themselves out of the picture. Which uh, and 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 uh, is, if they can't even describe themselves, maybe then they cannot describe many other things. Or the the self description reveals a, a deep the attempt at self description. What often happens, self references often collapse into contradiction. So that will be a minimum requirement one has, uh, you know. And 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 but it's not Luhmann is not the only one who has a super theory. So so Habermas has a super theory as well as. Uh, you know, with a Marxism, you, you can find that there's still a super theory there. So, um, uh, but, so that's not, it doesn't mean that it's an absolute, it's still set contingent, but it's a minimal requirement of a contemporary comprehensive theory of society. Uh, it was interesting when you, when you work with, um, you know, causality is, is so, so Luhmann has in the 70s, actually in the 60s, one of his first engagements was with the methodology of of uh, the social sciences, and he has a critical essays on how the sciences in general and social science in particular would treat causality is quite critical of that. And it's really the, about, uh, there is always a, 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 a very, very large, um, um, many, many factors which feed into any, of course, event in the wild. And what you then pick out as the cause is, a, is, is clearly a selection. And also in terms of the, uh, the effect, there's many, many the ramifying effects. So you have the effect and the cause, and then you have so many additional side causes, influences, as well as side effects. So there's, this is always a highly selective uh, process of, of description and, and, and should be relativized when it comes to any description of events out in the wild, which in the social sciences you have, because you don't have, uh, let's say you cannot control uh, the experiment in inverted commas. So then the difference in technology, in technology, we actually get the strict coupling of cause and effect through controlled environments, but they start break down also when things can become complex. Uh, the codes is interesting. I mean, the internal codes, I mean, I didn't come to that in, in too much detail, how, how, how each function system operates through a code. So it's, these are very simple rules. I mean, uh, for instance, I said everything in our in our um, everything we do, touch or or engage in, is under the spell of some kind of uh, legal encoding potentially. And the legal system, uh, when you then want to com communicate about it, there the code is legal illegal. So so the so you want to if you want to um, bring something in, into the into the legal system, you have to you know discuss it in terms of legal versus illegal norms versus facts, et cetera, with the lead distinction. And that, but then you then you need obviously, uh, that's just a marker, very abstract. And that was, it can like this be for decades and, and, and very persistently, the illegal legal distinction is just a marker uh, of getting something into the, into the system. And if, if, if you say legal, illegal, no, that's not relevant. I want to talk about something else and you're in the legal system, but then what is in a particular concrete situation where that is or isn't legal, there you need constitutions and statutes and they're going to be continuously legislated and rewritten and you need interpretive schemas. These are the programs through which the application of the code values, legal, illegal in this case, would be applied 
Uh, and that is something which we have, which we continuously revising, fight over, and 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 debate within uh, uh, the legal system. And that these programs are debating about the distinction, uh, the binary code, legal illegal, and how to apply it. That marks them as belonging to the legal system. And so the code in 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 architecture, I call it kind of resolve unresolved. I mean, functionally resolved unresolved, or formally resolved unresolved. And uh, so when we, everything with an architectural view in the end has to tie back to inform the question of how to concretely appraise whether something is formal resolved or not yet. And the programs for, for making this decision are the styles of architecture, similar to let's say the constitutions in the legal system, the styles of architecture are uh, a, you know, operationalizing the code as it were through concrete applicability, you make it a big applicability and that changes, that needs to be adapted. You know, what was functionally or formally resolved 100 years ago, it would now be kind of not because our criteria shift, our demands are shift, the heuristics shift and the similarly in the, in the sciences, is, is the, the code is true false or, you know, scientifically probable sound and in unsound. And the codes, the programs, they are the paradigms. Uh, the research programs and research paradigms through which one would, you know, that means proper methodologies of appraising and gathering evidence to, to, to apply the code values. So that's an interesting structure uh, as, uh, where, where you, and, and that makes the, the, the function systems because they're integrated through the binary code, ultra stable, and that can really persist for a very long time. You can have a lot of adaptive all the adaptation, all the innovation is absorbed in the programs, which, you know, uh, in, in, in the code is just marking is this is about we in architecture, this or we in the, in the design discipline, this is about whether this is formally is resolved or unresolved. And we, 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 the elemental operation is a design decision. And, and every communication in the end has to feed into that. And if it doesn't inform any design decision at any point, throw it out, cut it off. It was just uh, some kind of blah, blah. <laughs> and it doesn't belong to the discipline. Anyway, uh, I'm not sure that helped, but, but this was something we're gonna elaborate in, uh, uh, on in another lecture. So, thank you, Patrick. We, we're gonna have to wrap up things now. Sure, but, sure. I mean, really amazing, uh, fantastic for, for generosity. I want to make two comments. First of all, they, they sure. from, uh, Harith in, in Iraq, in, uh, from Baghdad in Iraq, says digital features really ha you, you help you helped kindle a renewed enthusiasm for my profession. There are lots of other comments in the in the chat. I want to just mention briefly uh, Giovanna Pelaka, who's in Lima, Peru, where, the, where she had a presentation yesterday. They had an earthquake, 7.5 earthquake here yesterday as well. So we're embracing the world in, in an incredible way, and this is going to be an incredible. A piece of information, knowledge, um, a repository of knowledge we're going to put up onto our YouTube channel. Patrick, I, I, I'm always, whenever I, 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 you're so generous with your thoughts and things, and you, I, but I always remember one comment that Peter Zellner made when you gave a presentation in uh, USC years ago, and you, uh, whether or not you agreed with, with, with him, uh, Peter said, well, eventually you bombarded him with kind of 400 images or so of Zaha buildings, and he said, I surrender, you know, and I think today, we're in a similar kind of way, you provided so much information on, on Nicholas Lerman, um, which is really I mean, incredible. So, you know, I surrender too. It's really fantastic to have this. I think this is going to be so useful for people in the future. And hopefully, you have put Nicholas Lerman on the map for architects worldwide. Um, thank you so much for this. To be continued. I mean, I, I look forward to hearing more about this. Um, absolutely fantastic, Patrick. Thank you so much. And thank yes, you. Yes, I will continue in the context of the Tongji seminar. So, so okay. you'll, see, you'll see more of that. Great. And, and thank you also for the team behind this who put this together. There's a huge team uh, making this, ha this happen. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Patrick. Uh, see, everyone, see you all next week um, for our session on Judith Butler. Thank, thank right. you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Good to see everybody.